Today's episode of What Happened When is brought to you by SaveCade.com. And Tony, I think you have outdone yourself. Uh, if you're listening to this and you haven't checked out SaveCade.com, you need to, not just because we'll be able to save some money, but this video is off the damn rails. It's S A V E C A D E. Tony, how in the world did you come up with this? This is proof that you take drugs. Maybe used to. I don't know if I do anymore, but but I do need to say that when I bring up Save Kate, there's a shot of me that looks awfully fat on there. I don't know how that came about. Maybe it's the way I look. But well, I do want to remind people that you can stop wrestling with debt, put your butt in the seat, fast and easy, no credit check, to be a part of SaveKate.com, Conrad. Well, and what's funny is, you know, the site even says mortal combat, all of your debt, no more hard way or easy way, brother. Uh, maybe that old kitchen's gotta go. Maybe you're desperately out of time to pay your house off faster. Well, we want to let you know that you don't need good luck and credit. Your credit doesn't have to look as good as the Z man did. And you can own a house with no money down, which is coincidentally how much money Evan courageous true. You can make this fast and easy. It can even be the greatest night in the history of our great sport. When you skip your next two house payments, and maybe you could even lower your monthly payments, which probably would have been helpful when WCW was taken over by Bill Watts and he cut your pay. Right, Tony? Yes. You can cut years off your loan, consolidate your debt, stop making the minimum payments. Believe you me, that will get you behind and get a greater tax deduction, Conrad. It's all part of SaveK.com. And what I love about it is you can own your own home with no money down my favorite thing about the thing though is you fucking dancing and singing i'm not making this up tony shivani dances and sings you've got to see it even if you don't actually need a home loan or need to save money you've got to see tony singing and dancing at savecade.com that's s-a-v-e-c-a-d-e nmls number 65084 equal housing lender Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to what happened when Monday on the MLW radio network, or maybe it's Wednesday. If you're not with us on Patron, either way, though, the man who is with us every single week, the reason we're all here, Tony Schiavone, what's going on, man? How are you? Is this not exciting or what to be able to do this show, uh, a show in general with you or this particular show? Well, take your pick in general. <laughs> Now, listen, I get asked every single week, Conrad, what's your favorite podcast to do? And without question, it's this one. No, it is, man. You, uh, you don't take your stuff too seriously and we can get on here and cut up and have a good time. And we appreciate you listening at home and joining us. And, uh, we had planned to air this on Thursday, a Thursday night tradition, but I guess it's fitting since this is the WCW show. We, uh, well, we WCW did and we didn't do it this year, but we're going to try again next year. But man, either way, better late than never. We're about to watch Starcade 1983. Now, a couple of days ago was the 35th anniversary of that show. Wow. What a timeline, huh? What makes it so exciting for me, uh, Conrad, is the fact that it was the first show really that I ever did. Uh, and, um, uh, 
I got a chance to work with, uh, I met Dusty Rhodes for the first time. Well, we'll get into it, but got a chance to work with Gordon Soley and and I got a chance to work with Bob Cottle. So it was it was quite a night for me. And so that's why I'm really excited to go back and look at it again. Well, let's not hold us up any longer. We want you to join us. Fire up your WWE Network right now and pull up Starcade 1983 from November 24th, 1983. Our main event is going to be Ric Flair and Harley Race for the NWA world title inside of a stainless steel cage. So this should be fun. Uh, now's about the time. We usually bring in some backup here, Tony. And let's bring in the one and only Lois Shivani. Three, two, one, play. You know, this is going to open up, Conrad, a little bit different. Uh, it, it opens up right onto action or right onto the to the to the ring. And I, I, I saw this. I was watching this earlier, and, and I was thinking that uh, was that the way we did things, or is that the way the WWE Network did it? But but I really think that. Back then, because it was closed circuit and it was an arena show, that they just opened up on action. And that's kind of the way things happened. Gordon Soley with uh, Bob Cottle doing the commentary, the Assassins 1 and 2, Paul Jones, and one of my favorites, Rufus R. Freight Train Jones, who was the Mid Atlantic Heavyweight Champion. You just saw him moments ago with the Mid Atlantic Heavyweight Championship belt, and Bugsy McGraw going at it. How about this for an opening bout? Yeah, I guess we should, uh, set the record straight. You know, they say that history is, is written by the victors or something like that. I probably butchered it, right? but the idea is most people think, you know, WrestleMania is the granddaddy of them all, but realistically not the case that happened March 31st, 1985. This predates that quite a bit. You know, we're here in November of 83. And this is the first time that a major wrestling event like this, a super show, if you will, had been put together with the ambition of closed circuit television. And it's pretty historic because this is really your first foray into professional wrestling, right? Oh yeah. For me, it's, it's absolutely spectacular, but yeah, it, it was closed circuit. It, it was not pay-per-view. There was no pay-per-view back then, but think about this. We had two star cage before they ever had a WrestleMania. Yeah. I mean, it, it, with, as you would say, without question, this is the granddaddy of them all. All right. That's twice that motherfucker. I'm going to work them in. I mean, it, at this point, was this the greatest night in the history of our great sport? Uh, be a long well, put my butt you. in the seat. I can tell you that. Uh, well, probably cause Foley wasn't around. Right. Cause then you would have just left and protest. Yes. Yeah. Uh, then I would have just left. Uh, again, this is Jody Hamilton. Who's in the ring right now. Uh, the mask assassin one, who was one of the greatest talkers that we had back then. Tommy young is the referee. Take a look at Tommy. How young Paul is Jones. Tommy right here, man? <laughs> Paul Jones down on this side and, and Bugsy McGraw, who, you know, who had that oddball character of his, and then on the outside, he'll make the tag. At least he should here in a minute. There he is. Here comes Hercules Hernandez in a mask. How about this? The mask assassin number two and Paul Jones, of course, their referee. You know, you would have, normally you would have a, uh, a, Paul Jones, their manager. I mean, normally you'd have a manager that would do the talking for you, but the mask assassin was better talking than Paul Jones was. And uh, unfortunately, Paul is no longer with us. Um, I don't know if you ever saw any matches involving or any, of course, you didn't grow up in the Atlantic area, but Rufus R. Freight Train Jones, who never became an international star, was a big star in the mid-Atlantic area. Uh, territory. He was from Dillon, South Carolina. He used the freight train where he'd get into the corner and he would just rev it up and run through people. And you know, one thing about Rufus, our freight train Jones, we can never understand a word he would say. He'd get on there and talk and no one could ever understand, but see how much, uh, he had, he had a lot of charisma, man. Look at that. What a different time in professional wrestling. You know, you hear old timers sometimes talk about how much more athletic the guys are today. And when you see a match like this, I mean that, how about that fucking camera work? There, <laughs> there is, there is no doubt without question. As you would say, when you see the physiques of Bugsy and Rufus and not Hercules, but certainly Jody Hamilton, these guys are not, uh, they're not exactly Michael Phelps. No, and they wouldn't be people that you would, that Vince McMahon would employ either. Uh, obviously because they're, uh, physiques, but, uh, 
And of course, now Rufus got the old hard head gimmick, right? Hit him in the head, hurt his hand, headbutt on the shoulder, bring Bugsy back in. Uh, Bugsy was a very uh, odd personality. I guess he made uh, most of his name, uh, famous name down in Florida. Uh, but um, now I'm in the backstage area right now, and I'm watching this. And I, I got there early in the day, and Dusty Rhodes had a uh, had a, a meeting, and I had never met Dusty before. But here we started this meeting, and here was Dusty with a coat and tie on and everything. And I'm thinking, what in the fuck is Dusty Rhodes doing here? And then I come to find out this was his idea, uh, and uh, this was his, uh, I guess, his uh, test run, so to speak. Uh, if he could book for the Crockett's. And so this began, this began Dusty Rhodes' run as the, the booker for the Crockett territory back then. Hang on. You, but, you didn't know why he was no, there? No, I didn't. Wow. I did not know. I guess, you know, that's worth mentioning because Dusty's not on the card. Well, why do you right. think that was? Do you think Dusty was trying to transition at this point? No, I, I just think, but uh, I, I just think that uh, he had not worked an angle in the Mid Atlantic Territory, and uh, maybe he wanted to show the Crockett's that he was all about booking and not about wrestling. Uh, we know that did not come to fruition. I mean, he was as much about wrestling and booking uh, down the road, but I just, uh, I, I just think that he wanted to show the Crockett's that he was a good guy to have behind the scenes. Sure. Or maybe they didn't offer him any money. Maybe they just said, come in, we'll see if you can book, but we're not going to let you wrestle because we're not going to pay anything. That'd be hard to imagine that you've got a star of the magnitude of Dusty Rhodes and he's in the building and you don't want to leverage it. Yeah. You know, you know, you're right. When you think about it uh, uh, and, and Dusty, listen, Dusty wrestled at the Greensboro Coliseum many, many, many times prior to 83. I went and saw him wrestle a lot of times. I saw he and Ric Flair as a tag team. Uh, years and years ago, and then uh, when and Flair turned on him at the end of it, man, Rufus, <laughs> Rufus had some charisma, man. Boy, I miss him. I never got to meet Rufus. Ne- really, never got to meet him. Uh, I think this may have been like his swan song with Jim Crockett Promotions. I don't think uh, they had much to do with him after that. I, I think we've uh, we've sort of buried the lead a little bit. A lot of our younger fans are going to know. Uh, Jody Hamilton from his days with the power plant. And, you know, the, I think a lot of people who probably listen to the show and grew up maybe in the nitro era are probably more familiar with his work behind the scenes for WCW instead of in front of the camera. Do you think that'll be his legacy? I don't think there yet without question. Thank you. I was hoping you could work that in. I, I knew you would lead me into that. Yeah, I think it would be because Jody was, uh, you know, we, we called it, 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 it's still called the gorilla position, but we called it the Jody position because he sat there, uh, and, uh, you know, sent guys in and out during TV and, and yeah, he, he ran the power plant. Paul Orndorff was there with him, you know, Sergeant buddy Lee Parker was a part of it as well. And think about how many, of uh, guys came out of the power plant that became big stars like Goldberg, one of your favorites. I don't have a problem with Goldberg. I just, I just don't like him. Don't want to didn't enjoy his matches. I, I could appreciate he was intense, but it ruined it for me. When you told me on the show here and the insane clown posse backed it up and other eyewitnesses that he tried to beat the fuck out of Evan courageous for scratching his balls or something silly like that. And it's just, I, I don't I think don't I brought know. up that story. I think you brought that story. Up. Well, you got that. And you know, he super kicked Bret Hart's head into the fucking fifth row and mm-hmm. It's just, you know, he's probably yeah. a very nice guy here. He does a lot of nice things for charity, but it is a running gag here on the show. So fuck Goldberg. How's that? <laughs> okay. And there's a roll up and did they get a three count? No, they got a two count that time. So, oh no, they got the three count. One, two, three, Paul Jones in the ring and a clean finish. And look at this Gordon Soley and Bob Cottle talking about a couple of legends here. I, I, there was uh, someone on Twitter, uh, who asked me a question. They said, uh, Gordon Soley called you Tony Schifoni. Why did he call you Tony Schifoni? I said, well, because in typical pro wrestling fashion, they didn't tell him how to pronounce my name. And then when he mispronounced it, no one corrected him. So he kept saying it. I think a lot of people probably 
thought maybe Gordon was hot about you being there and, and was just trying to bury you and shit on you. Not the case. Just no uh, typical Jim Crockett promotions at the time. Nobody communicating. No, nobody communicating. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, if you'll notice, they don't even have, uh, IFBs in and they're in front of this beautiful, <laughs> I'm six to beautiful. Say, <laughs> this looks like that? it's from a fucking eighth grade science fair. Yeah, it does. And, and you're like, they don't even have ISBs. I'm like, dude, they got that down from the office depot before the day started <laughs> with some mailbox letters. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And how about this? There he is. Oh man. How stoked am I to be standing there? First of all, I'm rather pretty. There goes Charlie Brown from out of town. I'm rather pretty right there, but there's Ric Flair and Roddy Piper in the back. Now, listen. This is what, this is my first big event. So I am just excited. I'm, I'm more than excited, man. I probably got a heart on right there. Wouldn't you think? Well, with Ricky Steamboat, Ric Flair, Roddy Piper, three of the biggest stars in the entire wrestling industry right behind you. And you've got a microphone that is as big as a baby's arm holding an apple. <laughs> and also I've got my uh, championship ring on there in the right. That was, uh, from the Greensboro Hornets, 1981 championship my first minor league baseball team and i have that championship ring on right there why did you have a ring because back then they gave announcers when they won the championship rings they don't do that anymore well eli gold's got a bunch of rings i know that yeah because he's he's part of the squad yeah he's part of the squad now we're now i want to set up this match by saying this that's trucking Tom Miller, the ring announcer. He was just a phenomenal ring announcer. Trucking uh, Tom Miller, trucking Tom Miller. You, you know the story about Trey. There's Johnny Weaver, Scott McGee. Uh, no, 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 no bottom third graphics or anything here. Well, he, again, eighth grade science project in the back, and and you're looking <laughs> for Chirons and IFBs. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I guess we should sort of put two and two together for some of our younger folks who are watching this, who've never seen it before. Johnny Weaver is the husband of, uh, Penny, yes. Penny Banner. Yes. Right. Oh, thank you. I lost it for a minute. Oh, uh, was, but he, uh, Johnny has since passed away. He was also a, uh, he was also a deputy sheriff. There's Mark Lewin, purple haze, I guess. And there, look at Kevin Sullivan. How young is he, man? Wow. Isn't it, isn't it crazy to see the influence in the business in the first match, you've got one of the guys who's going to help run the power plant and run your gorilla position. And the second match, you've got one of the guys who helped book all the heat for the NWO. <laughs> How about that? All right. Here's what I want to set up about this match, because it, it people ask me what I remember about the Starcade. Obviously I remember being the back. I remember meeting dusty for the first time. I remember the flare match. I remember being a part of it, but I also remember this match. And here's what I remember about it. Scott McGee is doing his first blade job ever in this match. And a lot of times when you do your first blade job, I think we've talked about this before in the old school days, they wouldn't let you do your first blade job. They said they would do it for you, but right. they would, they would think you would chicken out. Well, Scott McGee is going to get a heat here or going to get uh, juice here or color as they called it. Kevin Sullivan is going to gigging. Wait till you wait till you see this. And I remember watching it and noticing it right there. And this is Conrad. This is before I uh, look at this. I've been in the business now maybe a month, and I didn't know about blade jobs. So I, I but I saw it happen. I'm thinking he just cut his head open. And wait till you see it. And then Scott McGee is going to come back with me and Angelo Mosca. And he is going to be bleeding profusely. And it's going to really gross me out. So uh, when, the, when they bring in the golden spike, which they're getting that spike that they hit a buddy in the head with, you'll see Kevin Sullivan cutting. It's, it's an incredible. It's something that, that stuck in my mind for a long, long time. You know, it's funny. Um, that came, blades came up, I don't know, like a month ago at my house. Mm -hmm. because Mrs. Thompson was never really shown how the sausage is made, so to speak. And mm. just knew that every pillowcase at her dad's house had blood on it. 
you know, but didn't really know what was what. But then right. one day, um, and apparently it was part of the, the, the champs travel kit. Like it, he had a shave kit and he kept everything in there. And, uh, whenever he would come in, like the most critical things, you know, he had to have before he would leave out for the next tour, a robe and the belt and that shave kit couldn't leave without those. And, um, one day, I guess one spilled out into the laundry room and he walked in there barefoot and got one caught in his foot and oh couldn't get it out and had to have help. So Mrs. Thompson's there to help. And then is like, wait a minute. Why does dad have this that small and wrapped in tape? Wait a minute. And there was never like a conversation, but it just became, oh, I got it. I understand why my dad bleeds so much now or, or, you know, how it happened. And right. Cause I think, um, you know, if you've never seen one, you probably have a different, uh, impression of what it looks like and, and how it's handled and all that. And I've always right. been as a fan sort of interested in, you know, the guys, some guys put it in their wrist tape. Flair would famously tape it to his fingers. Some other right. guys would put it like, uh, behind their lip, between their lip and their gum, yeah, but just totally all, all this really creative ways to do it. But even after, you know, the business has been exposed for lack of a better word, there's still a lot of guys, Bruce Pritchard included, who just don't really want to talk about that. That's like, nope, you got to give me that. I'm not going to tell you about that. What well, you mean there? Well, hang on a second. Hold, hold the phone there. He is still trying to kayfabe you. No, 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 no. I mean, like on the podcast in real life, guys will say whatever, however, you know, just sitting around drinking beer. Oh, here's what I did. But sometimes on a podcast or on a shoot interview, guys are like, I'm not talking about that. I've just seen more than one of the boys sort of dismiss that. Like, nope, not talking about that. Yeah. So Bruce won't talk about it, right? Not on the show. No, in real life, you know, whatever. Wow. But on the show, I, I mean, he's always, and so I always have to like tiptoe around it on his show too. Like, you know, I, I try to use words like zip. Oh, he zipped himself because he doesn't want to blade. What are you talking about? Blade that type. Of oh thing. my God. Yeah. What's wrong with him? Then he, he wouldn't be a good guy to watch this match with because this is a very obvious blade job here. Sonny Fargo, the referee here, Gary Hart. Of course, Gary Hart was a great manager, and uh, I like Gary a lot. Gary, uh, Gary was a pretty good sounding board for me and and, and uh, my work when I was uh, first starting out in the business. He helped me out a great deal. Always, how, always gave me a lot of uh, pointers. He was a good guy to be around. Gary Hart was. How often does uh, Court Bauer reference Gary Hart when you're doing MLW with him? Uh, every ten minutes. <laughs> 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 No, uh, he was Gary Hart's uh, protege, right? Yeah, I know he re court really, really looked up to Gary and, and credits a lot of his sort of booking philosophy and the way he sort of thinks about the business with Gary. Right. Well, and it's, uh, Gary was, a uh, again, a, a very, uh, a very good guy and a very, uh, generous guy as far as his knowledge of the business and helping people out. And he was pretty funny too, behind the scenes Had a lot of time for Gary Hart. So I'm, I'm trying to keep my eyes open here to see when they bring that, uh, because I, I know some of these matches, early matches didn't go long. We saw the first one. They didn't go long. We're going to have a dog collar match. Uh, but I'm trying to just wait and see Johnny Weaver. Look, speaking of blades, did you see the close up of his forehead right oh, there? Yeah. Yeah. Like a roadmap, buddy. <laughs> so, hey, talk to me a little bit about the production that night. You know, just, okay. as, just as far as like the way it happened. You know, like this is, as we've said before, it's, it's before pay-per-view. Right. So what are you doing differently here than normal? Well, we, we've got a crew here. We've got like only like one ringside camera, I guess. We've got a, uh, we've got a couple of high cameras. We don't have a truck as of yet. If we got a truck, we just rented one. Now watch out here. Now see, here comes the, take a look here. Here's the golden spike. Mark Lewin gets it, and here's the cut. Zip. See it right there? Yeah. Wow. 
So they opened up these. I mean, they didn't just, you know, just didn't touch him. And sometimes that's all they, they would have to do, right? Just touch, look at this. Yikes. I mean, they absolutely opened up his forehead. And, and when he comes back, and we're going to do an interview with him, when he comes back, we're going to see his forehead lay it open. But, but as far as the production is concerned, it was just kind of a kind of a skeleton crew production. We had we had a couple of hard cameras, one that could swing around and get that that uh, Office Depot uh, <laughs> set that we had, uh, and we had uh, one guy in the back. And this is before this is before the Crockett's the Crockett's bought there's Angelo Mosca coming in. The Crockett's went on to buy a truck. You know, they bought their own video truck, but this is before they had their own video truck. Right before. Mm. Everybody on their feet at this bloody scene. Yeah, look at this. So you say you don't want to do a blade job, huh, kid? <laughs> Let Kevin Sullivan do it for you. I talked to Kevin about that uh, recently when he was up for MLW when he came up when we were up uh, in New York for MLW and he came up and I and, talked and to him about that. You mentioned this particular scene. Oh yeah, yeah. I, right, I said, Kevin, right. you remember when you? Uh, when you gigged him, I, he said, oh, yeah, I remember. He said, and we were in the back, and we were talking about who's going to who's going to blade me, who's going to blade Scott McGee, and Scott McGee said, I want Kevin Sullivan to do it. And Kevin said, are you sure? He said, yes, I want you to do it. Kevin said, all right, because he trusted Kevin. Oh, God. Can you imagine if uh, Chris Benoit asked Kevin Sullivan to blade him? <laughs> mm. I can only imagine all that. About 1997, 1998. I don't know if that would have went well. I I would agree. It probably wouldn't have gone well at all. Gordon Soley right, here, man, and Bob Cottle. Are these the two greatest voices in the history of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling? Not, I mean, I know you're not going to put yourself in there, so it's got to be these two, right? Well, yeah, Gordon Soley is the greatest voice in the history of Georgia Championship Wrestling and Florida Championship Wrestling, and Bob Cottle is in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Now, I think they're going to go back to me. Uh, don't smile guys. Go back to me. No, here's Barbara Cleary. How about Barbara Cleary? Does, do you remember who Barbara Cleary was? Nope. Never seen her in my oh. life. Okay. Barbara Cleary was, and here's how the story goes. They brought her into Florida championship wrestling. Uh, the, and I'm not so sure. I guess Eddie Grand brought, brought her in. She credits that, uh, Gordon Soley brought her in. She was a singer that could speak Spanish. They brought her into Florida championship wrestling to speak Spanish. And help out with interviews in Spanish. So she was, uh, she came up with Gordon and was in Florida Championship Wrestling. Look, me and the Briscoes, Greg Valentine, and would you take a look at Harley Race and that mustache and those sideburns? Dude, he, he's looking like a stone cold pimp right here. <laughs> Not getting his. Oh, man. He looks like the insurance salesman of the year. <laughs> He's the greatest insurance salesman on God's green earth. Green earth I've absolutely. got your term life. I've <laughs> got your whole life. I've got your accidental life. Don't get me started on that duck. Fuck the duck. You need Harley races. God's green insurance. Well, thank you, Harley. I'm getting ready to have another kid, and uh, we have one right now. I'm going to have one coming up at the first of the year, so thank you very much. <laughs> Dude, I'm out, I mean, Flair dressed Harley right here. This is <laughs> n not the usual. I mean, he looks like, uh, I mean, he's decked out there. And, and Talk to me about Trucking Tom Miller. All right. Trucking Tom Miller was a overnight disc jockey at WBT Radio in Charlotte. And he talked to all the truckers out there. That's why they call him Truck and Tom Miller. All the truckers would call him. They'd listen to his radio show. And he became quite a sensation. Would you take a look at the legendary Carlos Colon? He'll be going up against the Bill of the Butcher here. Dude, I uh, mean, this is, I mean, what are the odds there's going to be blood in Abdul of the Butcher versus Carlos Colon? <laughs> there's going to be blood. We brought Carlos Colon in. This was kind of like a, uh, because he was down in Puerto Rico and we wanted to uh, do Schwartz, the referee. Gosh, I can remember all these names. Uh, but anyway, truck and Tom Miller problem he had problems with alcohol. So he, he drank himself out of a job and then I got him a job. Boy, he's already went to the gimmick down these tights. 
uh, I uh, went, uh, I uh, had, was working at a radio station in Charlotte, K97 FM. I was doing morning sports and I knew Truck and Tom was looking for a job. So I talked to the program director and they got Truck and Tom a job. And again, they gave him the overnight shift on an FM station. And he again, Tom Miller again, got a cult following. The truckers would follow him. They called. Everything was great. And the program director one night listened and he heard nothing but dead air. And uh, so he got in his car, put the radio on, drove to the radio station, went up into the, uh, it was like at the top floor of this uh, office building. He went up there and truck and Tom was passed out in his chair, drunk, and they fired him. Oh, man. Uh, so, so, but Truckin was a talented guy and a great ring announcer. You could really say rock and roll express. We all loved him. A good guy. Just, uh, alcohol got the best of him. And that's a sad story. But look at, look at, uh, what's he got? Is he digging something down in his face? Yeah, dude. They're, they're cutting each other to pieces right now. They're, <laughs> they're, uh, doing a little hepatitis swap, swap <laughs> meat hepatitis. Now, you know, uh, this was, this was a match, I guess that they, if I remember correctly, and of course, as you know, my memory is not always that good, Really, but if I, yeah, if I remember correctly, this was a match that they did for Puerto Rico to bring back to Puerto Rico to show us an angle because Carlos Colon didn't wrestle for us and Abdullah the butcher didn't wrestle for us. So this was something they could bring back and they put this on the show and in America and look at that. He's got the. He's jabbing that route down in his head. Holy shit. Good God. You want to see how the business has changed? Just take a look at the first, the last couple of matches we've had. It's not like this anymore, man. No. Oh. Needless to say. No. By the way, I want to know, you know, you and I have touched on it before, I think very briefly, but we didn't really talk about it. Whenever I see these two guys together, I can't help but think about bruiser Brody and the way just a few years after this, he's going to be brutally murdered in Puerto Rico and allegedly, um, Carlos Colon and, and Abdul, the butcher knew more than was shared and ultimately, um, maybe justice wasn't served. What did you hear about the Bruiser Brody situation and, and, and what was the common thinking at the time? What I heard about the Bruiser Brody situation was that, and I think this is pretty much common knowledge that Bruiser did his own thing. Uh, and, uh, if he didn't want to do a job, he wouldn't do it. Uh, and he was very difficult to work with. Uh, Dutch Mantel tells me the story that they, well, he and whoever this guy was, Maybe you know who he was. That bruiser that night refused to do a job, and they walked into the shower, and he stabbed him with it or cut him with a knife, and he bled to death right in front of all of them. Wow. Um, and um, he had a son, according to, uh, and I guess this may be common knowledge as well, he had a son, and he told the guys that night just to, you know, take care of his son as he bled out right there in the locker room. And nothing happened to this guy. Well, they took invader to trial and ultimately, uh, he, he made it out and they even tried to recreate angles out of it and all that. But Tony Atlas, uh, yeah, they did angles out of it. It was really something else, but over in Japan, like Onita, who was like the death match King, he even tried to mimic it and it's just a. That's, that's pretty sick. Uh, the whole thing is, but, uh, one sick fuck, just pin sick fuck. Number two here with, uh, uh look, look at the blood in the ring. It's now, unbelievable. You said it was the invader that killed him. Wasn't it like a guy named Gonzalez or something like that? <laughs> Do you think his driver's license said <laughs> invader? <laughs> well, I didn't know if he wrestled the, as the invader. Or what I thought he wrestled as, uh, Jose Gonzalez or something. I don't know. Now, I believe he was, um, Jose Gonzalez is a real name, but he was invader number one, I believe. Okay. All right. Now here we go. Angelo got hit with a golden spike. So they cut his arm and then they're going to, and I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, holy shit, this guy is bleeding fucking out because they left him bleeding here. By the way, you could see Angelo holding his sleeve up and blading his arm. 
<laughs> earlier right. or during the attack. It's yeah, different different business. Back then, you weren't playing for the camera. You're you're playing for the live crowd. Right, exactly. Also, you know, he and Bobby Heenan were were friends and traveling partners. And Bobby used to Bobby used to fuck with him all the time. Really? Oh my God, Bobby's Bobby said Angelo was so great to fuck with because. He never did get the joke. Bobby said he. Bobby said I used to take uh, toilet paper or Kleenex and stuff it down in the toes of his shoes when he knew that we. He said when we would have a, like a long walk from a gate to a gate, and I knew we would have a long walk that night. He said I would stuff it down in his shoes, and, and Angelo would be walking down the along a concourse saying, "Oh, my dogs are really barking today. My dogs are really barking today," and he had said, uh, "Angelo had a wife who was a." who was a flight attendant and Angelo could travel anywhere because take a look at this bloody scene. First of all, Oh my, okay, Scott, uh, we're going to, we're going to cut you, but we're not going to sew you up until the next match because we want you to show the blood. <laughs> and so wait a match for us and then we'll sew you up. God mighty. It was just terrible. So anyway, uh, Heenan said one time they walked up to the counter and he said, my name is Angelo Mosca. My wife is Carol or whatever. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to get on this flight. And he said, I don't have my ID with me. And this is way back in the day, but my name is Angelo Mosca. My wife is Carol. And he had heard this going on. He didn't walked up. He said, Hey, Bill, you ready to go? Oh my God. <laughs> and so said, what the fuck? He said, he said, Oh, oh I'm sorry. You're doing that gimmick again, Bill. I got you. And he walked away. <laughs> So Heena used to give him shit all the time. He that said is he was just, tremendous. What a great Bobby Heenan story. Yeah. Heenan just was used to fuck with Angelo all the time. Is Barbara it, Clary went on to be, become a school teacher. I understand in Florida. Oh boy, man. What a different time in wrestling. This is look at what's going on in the ring. Yes, sir. We got Dick the ultimate Slater. warrior on one side. No, sorry. That's Wahoo McDaniel. <laughs> Jay Youngblood. And, uh, cowboy Bob Orton and Dick Slater on the other side, by the Some way, legendary performers in this one, man, Bob Orton, not only on the first WrestleMania, but here Starcade as well. We had a graphic. Did you see that? I did. The graphic flew in. It's like. Okay, let's try one out for the third match, guys. You think you get one ready for the third match? Oh, here it comes. Fly it in and fly. How about that, man? They were probably giving each, oh, we're going to fly in another one here. <laughs> Some silly looking shit here, Conrad. <laughs> Without question. <laughs> it looks like a Houston Astros uniform. Okay, so we can get off the graphic now. Three, two, one, fade back. Jackie Crockett running the camera at ringside and truck and Tom Miller, man. And of course everything was kind of just, you know, they really didn't have that many angles leading up to it with the exception of Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine and, and flair and, uh, Harley and Harley and leading up to this, uh, Harley would send the guys in to try to attack Rick flair on mid Atlantic championship wrestling to prevent flair from getting to this to this match. So that was the angle leading up to it. Are you at your most excited, uh, as far as to work in wrestling right now at this show? Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even know if I got paid to do this thing. I really don't remember it. I remember getting, I remember getting paid to do the, uh, they, they put a little bit extra in my, uh, baseball paycheck to do the, uh, interviews. Uh, and I know they paid me extra to do the TBS shows. And this, of course, TBS shows would be a year and a half later or a little bit over a year later. But as far as this show is concerned, I was just glad to be there, man. I was on freaking cloud nine. I mean, we're talking about a venue on a day that I used to go and pay to be front row. I was, I was front row ringside in 1977, Thanksgiving Day in Greensboro for a double ring battle royal. Paid for front row ringside tickets. And now here I am three years later, four years later. Shit. Absolutely. Most excited I've ever been. <laughs> Slater. 
uh, Slater, bless his heart, was a pretty good performer. Got any good Wahoo stories? We haven't talked about Wahoo a ton here on the show. Well, I told you that I've told you the story of the night he hit the lady, right? I think so, but tell it for everybody listening who maybe missed the old okay. episode. All right, uh, here's the story. This was Wahoo and uh, Magnum TA ended up, I think, being on uh, worldwide wrestling or Midland Championship wrestling, Charlotte Coliseum. It's where Magnum TA won the U.S. title from Wahoo. Wahoo was a heel. Wahoo picks up a steel chair. The finish is in a steel cage, picks up a steel chair. Magnum drop kicks a steel chair. Wahoo hits himself. Check a look. Wow. How about this camera shot? I love that. I do too. I, 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 I saw, think, I saw I it in the main of this shot. Man. I saw it in the main event, but I don't remember seeing it here early, but I think this, uh, uh, this is an angle that should be used more often. Yeah, I agree. So, so Wahoo picks up the chair. He gets mad drop kicks the chair. It's an old steel chair with the old, uh, the sharp corners on it. And it hits Wahoo Bay in the head and it cuts him. And that, I mean, really cuts him open. So we're in the back. Wahoo comes in the back uh, after they get him out of the ring. He walks in the back. I never will forget. As he walked through the door, he passed out. And they said, we got to get him to the doctor. So they got him to the doctor, to the hospital, uh, the emergency room. And they said, who can pick him up? And I said, I'll pick him up because Wahoo and I live close to each other. So I went to the emergency room because he went ahead and I picked him up. And Wahoo said, before you take me home, let's stop and get a drink. And we stopped at Bennigan's, which was near the South Park Mall in Charlotte, which was on our way down that way. And Wahoo was all, you know, all sutured up and was throwing it back one at a time. And I said, you know, I, I, I can't hang with you here, dude. Uh, and uh, he said, OK. And he was at the bar and he had been a big baby face even back at this time. He had been a big baby face and now he was a shit heel and everybody was mad at him. And a woman got on his ass for turning his back on all his fans and he had had enough of her and he turned around and knocked her off the bar stool. Cops were called and I said, uh, I got to go. Well, he said, I'll be fine. And, uh, uh, so uh, again, the moral of the story is when one who's drunk, it doesn't matter who you are leaving the fuck alone. Cause he was a, you know, a walk who was a legitimately tough guy. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys who in the, it was in the profession back in the day who really weren't, but Wahoo really was a badass. Uh, there's a badass in the ring right now. Uh, Randy Orton's dad. We don't talk right. about that a lot here on the show. You got any old Orton stories you can share with us? I do not because I didn't, I didn't know him at all. It's the only time I ever worked with him. So I, I don't know that much about him. I know his son's a damn good performer though. What about, uh, Dick Slater? Uh, Dick was a good guy, but Dick always came across to me and I may be wrong here. He always came across to me the guy who had been smoking a lot of dope. <laughs> he just, he was always smiling, always had the squinty eyes. How you doing? It just always seemed like he was high to me. May not have been, but uh, he was a pretty laid back guy. Maybe he did smoke dope. I don't know. I'm sure a bunch of them did. Why are you saying smoke dope? Because back then you would smoke dope. I know you get, now you can eat it. But back then he would smoke it to what I was told. I don't know what's going on with you. <laughs> you're trying to start some shit with me is what you're trying to do. No, just the, the phrase smoke dope sounds like something Barbara Bush would say. <laughs> so, so enlighten me here, millennial. What's the proper term for it? Uh, smoking weed, using marijuana. Smoking weed. I mean, you know, but smoke dope. I mean, it sounds like he's over here with a pipe and. Lighting up crack or could have been. I mean, no, it couldn't have been. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, let me rephrase that. Dick Slater looked to me, the guy that was always high on marijuana. There Does you that go. Sound better? Oh, that's much okay. better. Thank you for that. Okay. Good work and punch though. Take a look at that, man. I had a great work and punch. 
Then, of course, the maybe it wasn't working. This, of course, is one of my all-time favorites, Jay Youngblood, that I've told the story about many times that Jay and I just didn't see eye to eye. You know, I was the new kid in the back. And when I walked in the back, you know, kayfabe was over with me. And Jay just didn't seem to like the fact that I was there. And uh, kind of a dickhead, right? What's that? Kind of a dickhead, right? Yeah, he was a big dickhead to me. Uh, and he was the only, he's really the only wrestler I can say when they asked me any wrestler I didn't like, I said, well, it's gotta be Jay Youngblood because he wasn't good to me at all. So, uh, I don't mind them beating the fuck out of him right now. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Makes me happy that you took it to heart that much, that much. Yeah, I did. I did. Cause everybody was nice to me. I was part of the team. You know, why be a prick to me? And real, realistically, if you go back and you take a look at the history, who was the big star? It was Ricky Steamboat. It wasn't Jay Youngblood. Or was this Mark Youngblood at this time? Well, either way, you're happy he's getting his ass beat. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I, uh, Jay may have uh, wrestled uh, 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 this with is, Ricky. This is, this is Mark Youngblood. You're, this is Mark, okay. You're thinking yeah. of Jay, but he's going to team with Ricky against the Briscoes a little later. Right, because they were, uh, they were a, a, a pretty good tag team back then. And Ricky was always the better one of the two. I didn't want to stop you when you're on a roll shitting on somebody. It's fun. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mark was pretty cool, but you know, they were, uh, they were really the Romero brothers from Raleigh, North Carolina. By the way, did you see that, um, Jeff Jones put together a, somebody say something about lasagna t-shirt over at box. I sure did. I sure did. It looks just like the old, uh, FBI shirts that Tommy Rich wore in ECW, but now it says, out of FBI, WHW, and then somebody say something about lasagna, which is just <laughs> tremendous. Absolutely. Uh, also, I think it'd be a good time, speaking of Jeff Jones, for us to talk about, because coming up this weekend, as this show is being taped, you and I are going to be in Atlanta live. How about that, man? I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. We're going to be... At the Laughing Skull Lounge on Peachtree in Midtown there. Uh, we've got uh, VIPs coming, I know, and we're going to uh, meet the, and greet the VIPs, as always. And uh, then we're going to have a little bit of fun. We had, we had, you know, Conrad, thank you so much for everything. But, man, did I have a great time in Charlotte. And I hope we're going to have the same kind of time in Atlanta, too. What happened when live.com is where you can get your tickets. Only a handful remain. Unfortunately, VIP is totally sold out, but you can still get some general admission tickets. Tony and I are going to be there because Alabama is going to destroy the Georgia Bulldogs on Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'll be there hanging out, taking pictures, telling jokes, making you laugh at the laughing skull <coughs> lounge. So, uh, stop what you're doing. Cruise on over. Check it out. What happened when live.com and pick those up three o'clock in the afternoon. And listen, I, I do understand. I, I know you're a businessman. I get it. And you knew a lot of people would be in Atlanta that weekend because the sec championship, but you also want to do it so that you thinking Alabama's going to win, uh, can stick it up my ass for two hours, which is what you'll do without question. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Uh, then believe, but, believe it or not, I'm actually leaving that night, uh, and going to, as Bruce would say, Europa. Yes. I understand you are. So it just worked out where I could combust your balls and then go take a nap. <laughs> and then you're flying out to Europe that night or that next day. No, that night my flights at like nine. Oh, okay. Yeah, to Europa. <laughs> So where are you, where, where are your stops in Europa, you and Bruce? Ireland, Scotland, England. Wow. Now I think we've got six or seven shows. Wow. Yeah. It'll be, uh, I'll be so sick of Bruce by the end of that. Really? Oh, you're not sick. You're not sick of him now. No, well, we don't spend a lot of time together. It's not mm-hmm. enough time for us to get sick of each other. Okay. But that's going to happen next week. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. And I look forward to, uh, 2019, maybe you and I taking a lot of trips together as well. We've had some interest rumor in your window is that, uh, got some folks who like the idea of us going over. So I'm game yeah. if you're game. Yeah, I'm game too, man. I want to, uh, I want to go, I want to, uh, 
you know, again, the the, uh, the event in Charlotte was uh, kind of our, our starting point. You know, we're going to go on the 16th of December to Nashville and Zanies. But this weekend, we're going to be in uh, Atlanta, and hopefully it's the beginning of a real great year for us in 2019. You know, this is pretty fundamentally a pretty good sound match that we're watching. And, and I say that the heels have gotten the heat on Mark Youngblood. He made the hot tag to Wahoo. They get the heat back on Wahoo. And I'm sure there'll be some sort of four way into a finish. But uh, this is this is a good match. This this is a fundamentally a sound match. And some guys who can really perform miss that move, though. Wahoo in, in the in later in his in his career, you know, would wear that singlet to keep his. And I talked to him about. It. I said, "Keep that singlet on. Keep your belly tucked in there, right?" And he'd laugh. Well, it was for the badass he really was, man. I, I had a, I had a lot of fun with him. You know, it, it's just so cool when I think about this, and I, and I think about that. I was such a big fan of, of Wahoo and Flares and Blackjack and those guys, and then the Steamboat, and then I got to work with them, and I got to be their friends, and that's just. And here we are, what, 35 years later, and I I still pinch myself about that. Pretty cool life you live, my man. It was. It was it was it was I was I was very cool. <laughs> a great sell job, Bob. What, what are you throwing away. around over at your house right now? What's that? What are you throwing around over at your house right now? I'm not throwing anything around. Okay. Sounds like you're packing up boxes or something, like you're getting the oh, hell out no. of here. Yes, we're going to move to Alabama. How are you going to transport all the dog hair? <laughs> it, it it compacts very nicely. You can put it in layers in like 10 boxes. I was thinking maybe that around. would be like the ultimate collectible is we could sell like dog hair pelts. How about that? Anybody would think of some, something shitty like that. It'd be you. Hey, I know, Tony, when you go take a shit, we'll sell that. If you think right now, Efren would not buy that for cash money. You're wrong. That's done. Like he's PayPaling me right now, wherever he is. <laughs> That's terrible. Oh, it's but your chair. It's your chair popping. That's what I'm hearing. Oh yeah. It's the chair. I thought it was, I, I, I was like, what is he doing over there? It's making all that noise. Right. No, it's your chair. I got a brand new desk here in my office. Brand new desk. Thank you very much. Conrad Thompson. I didn't get it for you. Oh yeah, you did. Uh, I got this brand new desk and, uh, it's just, uh, life is good right now, man. Life is great. It does not suck to be us. No, it does not. And I just came back from the Cayman islands where it was 80 degrees every night. Hashtag humble brag. Uh, yeah. And, the, and then, uh, and of course I had to watch basketball. Sometimes that's not too cool in a high school gym. I love you said had to. <laughs> Got paid to watch basketball. There you go. And you know what I you know what I found out in you know what I found out in, in the Cayman Islands? What's that? Chickens are running around the Cayman Islands like like stray cats running around in the US. Yeah. In the city. You didn't know that? No, they're everywhere. And then, then I'm then I'm uh, I'm driving. Okay, I'm in. A, I'm I got a rental car and I'm driving on the left side because it's a United Kingdom territory or island. And I'm driving on the left side with the wheel on the, you know, the passenger side. Look at this. And I go by a Kentucky fried chicken. Dick's about to jump off the top rope and then just (laughs) climbs to the top rope, down to the second rope, down to the bottom rope, down to the apron. Then says, fuck it. I'm just going to the step. Bob Orton. though, boom. There he goes (laughs) to the floor. What a big move that was 35 years ago. Absolutely. Didn't mean to cut you off. Get back to telling us about your chickens. No, I was just saying, I drove by a Kentucky fried chicken and I just laughed out loud. I'm thinking they'll never run out of items here. They just go outside and pick off one off the street. Wow. Cool story, man. Real cool. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. I mean, they just broke Wahoo McDaniel's fucking arm, but you had to tell us about seeing KFC. KFC of the Cayman Islands. That's right. I wonder if they got beer and cans there. <laughs> yes, they do. I can I just tell you that I think we have we've gotten over Jimmy Hart's famous bar and Tiki Deck more than he ever has? 
I'm sure we've done a great deal. Look, look at the nature boy. Would you pop pop? Yeah. Notice how yeah, I see uh, Rick. I see you're just sitting here. I see Ricky steamboat and uh, who's that piece of shit in the middle. Oh, it's Jay Youngblood. Look at them dark eyebrows, man. You know what? This was I, uh, yeah, God love him. Th th this this ain't the Ric Flair we knew. I mean, it just he was really baby facing it here. But I and we needed sucks. to see Flair baby, strut. And, yes, baby face Flair in this era sucked. Yes, it wasn't until years later when he realized he could still be a baby face and do all that crazy shit. Right. But at this point, he's probably thinking, "Well, this is what they want." Right. This is what a baby face is. I've got to fit in the box. Right. And, and this, you know, I know a lot of people talk about, oh, Stark 83 and I'm glad we're covering it because it's because, because of its significance to the business and to you, but the flare stuff, I'm just like, Ugh, not my favorite flare stuff. No, he was just, uh, he look, look at him. He, he's, uh, he's just a serious look on his face. He's subdued. He... Oh. I mean, he's, he's like blonde haired Ricky steamboat here. Exactly. And, and really, and you know what? Think about this. You know, he's the one that, that said, I guess went to George Scott and said, I can make some money with Ricky steamboat. Right. And I, I guess he looked at Ricky steamboat and the way he presented himself as a baby face and wanted to present, look at this, would you? Here's our booker, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes and Barbara Cleary. Let me just tell you how much I love dusty in the yellow shades and that polo tie, that polo tie he made famous. He did. Well, it, it, he wore it in a lot of his old promos on Saturday. Like specifically, yeah. I remember it in the, uh, put your hand against my hand hard times promo. Yeah. The guy's working on his car standing behind him there. Obviously the fuck get him out of there. Two times heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah. And of course now, you know, he's, he's, he's setting up, he and Rick. Oh, we got a, how about that? We got a bottom third here. By the way, uh, everything he said in the promo right there, uh, was not clear at home because you guys had audio problems. Surprise. Well, again, uh, again, uh, we had audio problems because we we, we were going too fast. Right going way too fast for what we could do. And, uh, but you know, again, it wasn't hard to sell out the Charlotte Col I'm, I'm sorry, the Greensboro Coliseum on Thanksgiving day. You think, uh, your boy Bruce Mitchell was there. I'm sure he was. I, I, I saw one of the guys walk behind dusty right there that I recognize. I'm sure Bruce was now this is for what? What do you mean? It's for what? It's the NWA Television Championship. It's title versus mask. It's Charlie Brown versus the Great Kabuki. <laughs> how about how would you describe the Kabuki outfit here? Uh, it kind of looked like a a <laughs> it kind of looked like a, a celebratory ninja here. <laughs> how would you describe a Conrad? <laughs> Very kabuki ish. <laughs> Look at that. Is that Lois? <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. Hey, she's I said, taller. She's I, taller than that. I wanted to get your opinion. I sent you a mock up of a t shirt I want to sell. I saw that. And what do you think? It ain't going to fly. It was funny, though. It was funny. I didn't even. I did not even show it to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got to have a way to get that phrase over, and we'll, we'll use the phrase on a different. Okay, L look, we can use the phrase, all right, and we can use the, her face. Just got to fix some other stuff. Yeah, you, uh, you better get a, a much skinnier person on the on the bike than that. That's what makes it funny. I, I know. Okay, then use somebody's face because. She would immediately say, I don't, I'm not that big. I, I've lost a lot of weight. Well, that, and I would that's, say, that's not even her. That doesn't matter. I'm just, you know. Okay. It made me laugh out loud. Well, yeah. 
So here's the deal I behind work- the scenes. I sent Tony a mock-up of a shirt of Lois, well, actually Lois's face pasted right. on another woman's body pasted on a motorcycle. Right. And it had the phrase below it. Tony hit him. Uh, Cooter mama. Was that it? Cooter scooter. Cooter scooter. Okay. I knew it was cooter something. <laughs> I just thought cooter scooter was hilarious. I thought this would be tremendous. It was without question. <laughs> and now it was. you're telling me you can't do it. But yeah, but, but the, the lady, it was the lady on the cooter scooter was rather rotund and she ain't going to go for that. So, all right. So can we put, um, why don't we do Medusa's body with Lois's yeah. head? Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll still put cooter scooter on there. Sold. You think she'll go for that? Sure. She will. Okay. It's done. And that's going to be a new t-shirt at LoisRules.com. <laughs> yeah. Or boxgimmicks.com. Yeah. One of those. Yeah. Boxgimmicks.com or something like that. You know, uh, ben, had we used the big woman, the website would have been LoisKills.com because that would have happened to me. I mean, would Lois have even known unless it was on Facebook? No, you're right. Uh, maybe yeah, exactly. if old slapdick Matt Shivani shows up at Christmas wearing a cooter scooter shirt. <laughs> Well, slap dick Matt Shivani's over here to my right shoulder. I, I'm aware. You told me. Okay. Can I just tell you that uh, I feel like Kabuki and like right now, like I want to lay down just watching this show? <laughs> That's about all you're going to get out of uh, Charlie Brown down, from downtown. Because with, uh, with Charlie Brown and with Jimmy Valiant, pretty much it was the entrance and that was about it. You know, he's still performing. Have Absolutely. we talked about this before? Yeah, he is, Daddy. Still performing. That's right, Daddy. And he's like he's like ninety pounds. That's right, Daddy. I mean he's I mean, how old are they? listen, Jimmy Valiant's in his seventies. What's the problem, and Daddy? And he's still performing. What what's he supposed to do? Well, I mean, there's gotta be a time when you you say I'm not gonna go to the ring anymore. Oh, so there's a time where you say, uh, I, I don't need, I don't need to feed myself or pay you to, well, you or... know, no, no dumbass. No, I didn't say that at all. I said that the deal is you can make a living without bumping. Okay. Or, well, well, maybe well, it doesn't bump. Well, 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 what are your, uh, what are your job opportunities you've got lined up for Mr. Valiant? Was he at WrestleCade? I don't know if he was or wasn't, but you're apparently going to tell him what he can and can't do to make money. So I just thought you had some gigs lined up. So how was Russell Cade, by the way, do you have a good time? I don't know. You don't know. I did my show with Bruce after Russell Cade, but I mean, I oh, you didn't I, go to Russell Cade. I, I wasn't able to attend the matches or the actual convention. Okay. But it looked like a tremendous success. Uh, maybe, I don't know how long they've been doing this thing, five years running or more. And. I think, uh, the promoter, Mr. Tracy Myers, he's going to be doing it again, big next year. If I had to guess. And of course you won't be there. No, because I've got Georgia and Georgia tech, by the way, uh, that didn't work out for Georgia tech this weekend. Did it? Now nah, I could, after the first, uh, series, when Georgia went down and scored, I knew it wasn't going to work out for them. It didn't work out too well for Auburn this weekend. Did it? Nope. Got it broke off in them. Well, boy, did they ever. Holy shit. Without question. <laughs> Holy shit. Notice how these two guys have not done much of anything here. Dude, uh, this is the worst wrestling show we've reviewed. No, it's not. It's up there no, with Starcade 91. I don't I'm not so sure about that. It's, it's real bad. Let me just tell you. Okay. But, but still, I mean, the green mist all over his hands, the sleeper hold. Now the claw that, you know, it's claw can be terrible. very deadly at times, no, but it here it's, it's awful. It's just awful. Oh, back body drop. Here he goes. Another one. He's got to hit him with his elbow. Another eventually. one. Oh, <laughs> and just lay down. How about that world television title? I mean, that, that belt. Is it still around? Does somebody own that belt? Yeah. Believe it or not. I think, uh, Dave Milliken found it a couple of years ago. 
that's so old. I didn't even remember it, man. I, I remember the one after that, but not that one. I don't remember. I don't know why, but you saying that's so old. I don't even remember. It makes me happy. <laughs> I liked the Mid-Atlantic Tia, the Mid-Atlantic Championship that we saw in Rufus R. Freight Train Jones. I always liked that one. You know what happened to that one, don't you? Nope. Buzz Tyler got mad at Gene Anderson one day during interviews uh, and came in to do one interview for Kansas City, and Gene wouldn't let him do it till everybody got finished. And right at the end of the day, Buzz says, I've been here all day. I've been very patient, and you won't let me do my one interview. Fuck you, I'm leaving. He left and took the Mid-Atlantic belt with him. We never saw him again. And he's probably still has Avalanche Buzz Tyler. Good to know. Yeah. Throwing him in my machine right now. Buzz Tyler. I want to get that belt. I'm sure he still got it if he's still alive. I was just Maybe it's in his attic. Maybe he's got a lot of dogs. Maybe he's got dog hair in his attic, too. Well, then I'll never fucking see it. You never know, man. That thing could appear at any time. No, it's not. Oh, yeah, it could. Look at Charlie Brown. Is he the best kisser in wrestling that you know of? Yes, that I that I'm familiar with. Yes, he is. Was he um, a generous and unselfish lover? Uh, I don't know if unselfish would be right. He was generous. Um, there he goes back to the claw, Conrad. Just quivering and laying in the ring. Hmm. This is part of the angle where, you know, Jimmy Valiant had lost a loser league town match. So he put the mask on and came back as Charlie Brown from out of town. You see, he had to leave town, but he came back from out of town. So that was the angle here. What do you think of, uh, Kabuki? We haven't spent a bunch of time talking about him. I didn't know that much about him at all. Never talked. No, I don't mean about him as a, a real life person. I mean, as a gimmick, you know, he's not the most intimidating looking dude, but yeah, he does have an interesting gimmick. Yeah. I mean, look, he, he didn't, have, he had kind of a barrel chest and barrel belly. And I, I just, I never did think that much of him. But he's going to go up top again. And of course, he's going to bring the lame man back down to his back again. This may be, this may be as long. Well, here it comes. Take a look at that place. <laughs> uh, he's coming back. No, he's going to lay down again. Good night, Santa Claus. And quiver a little bit. Now he's going to take the mask off. And we're going to find out, Conrad, if in fact it is Jimmy, the boogie boogie man. <laughs> oh, I'm so curious. <laughs> I've been waiting on this all day. Charlie Brown from out of town. This may be the longest match Jimmy Valiant's ever had in his life. Certainly the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Can't no deny it. He's going to go down. Oh, there he goes. Dave, laying down again. Laying down again. God bless him. Can I just tell you that I'm excited for the next three matches we've got in a row, Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine in a dog collar match. Then we've got the world tag team championship on the line with steamboat and young blood against the Briscoes. And finally Harley and Rick in the main event, much better than what we've seen so far. So now, wait a minute. We only got three more matches to go. Yeah. A ton of time left and three matches. Wow. There it is. There's that's the finish. That's boogie woogie man's finish. One, two, three, his elbow drop. And he wins it and Gary Hart can't believe it. And Charlie Brown from out of town wins the belt. <laughs> Gary Hart. Uh, bring back some great memories. This is also before Think about this. Well, let's go back to the, the office depot set now. 
the opposite. Where, the opposite. Gordon, yeah. Yeah, where Gordon and uh, Bob Codler are going to have a few words. Keep in mind this that this was this place was sold out, but we didn't have obviously lighting uh, budget, or we would have lit the the crowd a little bit better. But who are we going to bring in? Oh my God, it's freaking Dude Walker. Who the hell is Dude Walker? Dude Walker. <laughs> Holy shit. He was a disc jockey in the, in the Atlanta area. And I, I still, he lives in the Gwinnett County area right now. And, uh, would you take a look at this? I don't know why they brought him in. So there was dude. And there he went. <laughs> Against his appearance by dude Walker. <laughs> Dude, it would kind of be like Casio Kid making a surprise appearance. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are relieved that he's not doing a run in right now. <laughs> Me being one. Well, why do we uh, have? Well, why? Why is there Casio hate? I don't know. You have to ask the people who hate him. I just, I, just, I don't hate him. I love him. I just like giving shit. Uh, he uh, he lost a family member this last week. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. Prayers for Casio. Okay. Well, you know what? In the morning, I'm going to send him a text. Tell him I'm sorry. Wouldn't send it right now. I'd probably wake his ass up. No. Nope. He get he's, up early. He's, he's, he's awake. He is? Yeah. Doesn't he have to get up early to do his morning show? It uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> wow. Gordon and, and, and uh, Bob Cuddle are going on and on and on here. Without question. You know what? You, you, you being a collector, even though as shitty as that thing would look, I'd love that thing, to have what, it. I would love to have it. And me and you would do promos in front of it in our live shows. Wow. Go back to me. God, that was handsome. So no, now. No, you weren't. This is, you you oh, look yeah. like you're the president of the science club right here. Well, I'm, I'm here talking to a Harley race and Harley. Uh, we're getting ready to have another kid. I've checked with Lois, and we don't want to buy any more insurance. See that what they're doing here now is Harley is telling uh, Ric Flair that he's got friends like Bob Orton, like Dick Slater, that will make sure that he uh, leaves Greensboro with the belt, even though it was a cage match to keep guys like this out. I never did understand that. But that's the way it is. This is also my first time in the backstage area of the Greensboro Coliseum, so I'm pretty pumped up about that. I like that you can hear your fandom, you know, when you watch this old stuff. Yeah. Man, absolutely. I've got, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I ran, I ran across a stack of pictures that I took outside of the Greensboro Coliseum probably three years before this. Because I used to get there early. You know how some fans would get there early and watch the wrestlers walk in? You were one of those guys? I was one of the, one of those guys. I sure was. Now, doesn't it look here like Dick Slater maybe had smoked a doobie? Does that kind of look that way to you? It looks like Harley Race just went fishing with his bare hands. By the way, a, a mutual friend of ours, I ran into at the uh, bar at, uh, Starcade or Starcast. No, I'll get it right. Wrestlecade. Wrestlecade. And he said, uh, when, when your name came up, I'm not going to do the voice, but he said, uh, me and Tony have something in common. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, we still got lead in our pencil. Just nobody to write to. <laughs> I fucking spit my drink out. I was not ready for that. It was the funniest thing I'd heard all day. I'd never heard that expression in my life. Tickled me. That is great. <laughs> oh, we're going to have Dusty talk for a second time. Yeah. Once in the crowd with the same interviewer and now once in the back. Yeah. But the reason we're the doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Well, maybe not the exact same, but. You know, since the audio wasn't coming in exactly right earlier, it makes sense to do it again, right? Dad said that's exactly right. And that's probably why they did it again. Uh, 
Wow. Sure do miss Dusty. He's the best, man. Yeah. There's nobody like him. Did you uh, ever have a conversation with Dusty just about, you know, the significance of Starcade? Not, no. not here, just in general. Did, did he ever sort of wax poetic about his creations and what he valued more than another? Like, where did Starcade stack up against uh, War Games or some of his other innovations? Look, Dusty and I did a lot of, we did a lot of talking because we traveled the road together a lot, but most of the talk with Dusty was looking ahead. Right. Uh, what What's coming up next? What we got to do? What we got planned for the future? Where, and one thing he always told me was, I wake up every day, I never will forget this, I wake up every day thinking this is going to be the day that I make a million dollars, that I'm going to come up with that one idea that's going to make a million dollars. And he always said, you, you try, you need to talk big. You need to think big. And thus he would think big. And sometimes the big was silly. And sometimes the big was good. I have no idea who these guys here on the left are with Greg Valentine. Unless that might be Gary Royal. I don't know. Valentine was the U S heavyweight champion. Here's comes another graphic. They're breaking out some graphics now. Yes. Here's a story about a man named Roddy. I, I have no idea who these guys are, but that I, I believe that is Gary Royal right there. In the left, here's Greg Valentine, who can't smile. What was it about Greg Valentine? He he, he didn't have much of a personality. Uh, yeah, much charisma, but he he certainly did make some money, didn't he? I don't know. I didn't like him. Okay. But I mean, he did. Okay. I believe you. I'm allowed to not like him. Okay. That's right. Uh, and, uh, but he made plenty of money, but I mean, he was in the mid Atlantic area. He was, he had great runs with Wahoo. He had great runs with Flair as his partner. And who in the hell are these guys? Check that shirt out, man. I like that shirt. One of those guys is Johnny Fairplay. <laughs> nah, Johnny Fairplay just a little scrawny pissant. No, that's after cocaine, Johnny Fairplay. This is pre cocaine, okay. Johnny Fairplay. Pre cocaine, Johnny Fairplay. Okay, yeah. I, I, he's gonna have that as a shirt. Pre cocaine, Johnny Fairplay. Finally got to meet Johnny Fairplay at our show in Charlotte. He's a gimmick and a half, isn't he? Oh, he's a walking gimmick, man. I've never seen them. I've never seen a guy with a with a jean jacket on with so many sewn on patches and, and eyeliner and hair extensions and lifts in his shoes and an entourage. Okay. So you chat me up here. Johnny fair play one survivor one time. No, he never won it. No, but he was in it. Yes. And it was, it was the eliminated like right at the beginning. Uh, no. He faked his grandma's death and, and stayed in a little longer. Jesus. Cause I, I've never watched survivor and I'm thinking when I saw him, I'm thinking when I first saw him, it's like this little guy, won survivor. Come on. All right, here we go. You, you didn't <laughs> think that he could win survivor. No. All right, here we go. This is uh let's be serious for a minute. All right. We're serious. Here. Maybe the most important match of the first arcade. Why do you consider this an important match? Well, it's a dog collar match. Can you name a more famous dog collar match than this one? No, no, you're right. And this was, wasn't this, uh, basically Piper Swan song. Well, it's interesting to me that you see Piper in such a big rivalry, a heated feud here and such an important match on the first Starcade. really one of the building blocks of this entire show. And then he's going to be in the main event of the first WrestleMania. People sort of sleep on the significance of Roddy Piper, I think. Yeah. Piper, you know, Piper was, and you may know, you may know this. Uh, I, I've heard the story that, you know, Piper was, you know, he, he wrestled many, many different territories and he, he was, he was down in Georgia for a while and he was Gordon Soley's color man. Do you remember that? Yep. 
And didn't they enjoy some of their best ratings with Roddy Piper serving as a color guy? Yeah. Piper popped the territory everywhere he went, as they say. Right. Had a great in the, just, uh, probably two years before this, I would think maybe three years, but in the mid Atlantic territory, he and flair had a big run against each other for the U S heavyweight championship. And now look at him slugging it out and look at all the blood is already on the ring. Conrad, this is from the previous matches and they're just going to add more blood to this man. And so when you, when you see, uh, shots of Ric Flair and Harley race in the cage match, you think about, look at the blood of a lot of the blood was prior to Flair and, and race getting in the ring and they bled as well. Piper, by the way, uh, Kept that dog collar with him everywhere. He had a Halliburton case, and he would bring that dog collar in the Halliburton case to the backstage area uh, at the Crockett uh, headquarters and do the uh, and do his interviews with that dog collar. So that was his to keep everywhere. It was kind of like his belt. Pretty damn good bump. They're going to tell a story here and they get plenty of time to do it. I got a lot of heat, uh, a couple of weeks ago for not giving Greg Valentine his proper due. Apparently we got a lot of damn Greg Valentine fans listening. So we're going to get more heat by talking about, by wondering why he was so over. Uh, hey, listen, I, uh, again, being a guy who grew up in the mid Atlantic area, I, he was over with me. I saw many, many matches where Greg Valentine was on top. And of course, there was a story, you know, look at this, man. How do you work this? How do you work pulling a, pulling a chain taut across a guy's no, bridge of his nose and his eyes? Holy shit, man. Of course, his elbow was his you know, primary weapon. And the, I think we talked about this earlier. There was uh, in probably a previous show, there was an ad, there was a, uh, we, he came across as, look at this, man, God almighty. He came across as the storyline was he was the brother of Johnny Valentine. And Wahoo exposed it on an angle that he was actually the son of Johnny Valentine. So I don't know which was which. But that was an angle in the, in the Mid-Atlantic Territory one time. I wish I could be more into this. You're not enjoying this? No, this match is cool. But this show as a whole to me is a thumbs down. Really? And I know that, you know. This is a very significant show for you. Yeah, it is. And, and look, it, it, it always seems better when you're doing it. And, and this was a different time. Had you, had you watched, had we been watching this and watching the replay of this, let's say two years later, we would have looked back on this saying, we'd have watched this, let's, this replay in 85. We would have gone back and said, man, this was great. But think about all, all that we've been exposed to in the 35 years, how wrestling has changed. Right. So, yeah, it, it's all what you've been exposed to. I mean, it's the rules of wrestling, although they're supposed to be different, are supposed to be the same or different. Now, Greg Valentine is bleeding profusely here. Look at this. He had just wrapped that chain around his face. Get out of my way, cameraman. <laughs> We're trying to, how about that? Cameraman turned around to show those people, and they were like, get out of the way. <laughs> we're used to coming to the Greensboro Coliseum where cameras are not in the way. They knew how to, they knew how to work this dog collar match, man. Look at that. Wow. I don't know how to work it yeah. that much. I mean. Yeah, it's, it's probably not. It's probably more shooting than anything else. Yeah, I mean, apparently... Piper's going to bust an eardrum here and he's going to suffer hearing damage for the rest of his life because of this match. Yeah. And you really just can't, you can't really, uh, 
probably pick one moment where you say, oh, that was a blow that suffered ear damage. It's just probably a cumulative thing here. Did you say cumulative? Cumulative. Okay. Is that anything like library? Yeah, it's one of your words you can't say. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what's the proper way to say it? Cumulative. Cumulative? What did I say? Cumulative. <laughs> okay. Oh, I put the L in the wrong place. It would be cumulative instead of cumulative. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a word that's going to haunt me the rest of my podcasting life. No. I mean, listen. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, here's what oh, I'll yeah. do. I'll get you set up down at the library, <laughs> and we'll get you straightened out. You'll be good. Thank you very much. Look at this, man. Oh, God. Piper fucking bleeding as well. Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. These guys didn't have any any uh, health insurance back then. Either. None. Right. Think about what they did. And and I brought this up many times. If these guys would have gotten hurt in this, and they, as you said, Greg Valentine did. But let's say they would have, I don't know, blown out a knee. They still would have wrestled the next day because they had to, or they wouldn't have gotten paid. And that's why I've had, I have so much respect for, for what I consider old school guys. Not only because a lot of them were tough son of a bitches, but because of what they had to endure to make a living. They made great livings. Yeah. But I mean, they, at the, at the, uh, at the sacrifice of their, probably their families, uh, having a normal life and, no health care and holy shit. I mean, if, if a guy needed to be stitched up, that guy was got to pay for it. Right. And this is, this is uh, now more from a, a wrestling match into just fucking gore fest. Holy shit. Piper doing a great job here, man. Tom Miller standing up like, what the fuck are we watching? This is a hell of a performance here, Conrad. You got to admit that, man. No, it's the best match on the card. I mean, it's brutal. You know, we're yeah. not going to be able to do this thing justice. You know, we, I've sort of been dumping on the show here and I know a lot of people listening to this are going to be mad at me. Well, hate tweet me. Ah, hey, hey, it's Conrad, but go out yeah. of your way to watch this. I think. This is probably Piper's best and most important match. I mean, I would put it up there with him and Bret Hart at WrestleMania eight. Yeah. Oh, you can hate tweet me at go fuck, go fuck yourself. Yeah. You don't really like it that much. What? When people try to fuck with you on uh, social media. No, look, I, I don't mind. I don't mind people fucking with me on social media. I don't mind it at all. I, I, uh, if the, if the person's not following me and he tries to fuck with me, I'm thinking, eh, he's just taking a shot. But if somebody follows me on social media, I don't mind. Hell of a match kids. Notice a uh, very young bill after down at ringside as well. George Nalapatano is there as well. And also got some other cameramen from Japan. What would you, what, what's George's last name? Nalapatano. Okay. What, what is it really? I mean, he's your friend. I'm not going to tell you how to pronounce he's it. He's not my friend. I thought it was Napoliatano. Napoliatano. Okay. I, don't know. I mean, here's the deal. I'm from Alabama. What do I know? <laughs> he's just <laughs> blood all over his face. He just realized he's bleeding. Oh man. What'd you call him? Nalapatino. Nalapatano. It's, it sounds like an Italian dish. <laughs> I'm going to have a ribeye. She's going to have the, uh, <laughs> Nala we'll Patano. Have, have Nala ice cream for dessert. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. I, I was told that, uh, you actually call your penis Neapolitan. <laughs> no, I call it big Josh. Oh, that's right. You renamed it. That's right. We already named that. Yeah. What Some did, people uh, on Twitter have, have understand that. I think we got a whoa, whoa, whoa. You got you got undercover hose on Twitter? No. Hey, 
you just saw a close up of the face of Greg Valentine. And I'm wondering why we haven't had more close ups. Look at this, man. Holy shit. It's almost like they sped the tape up. Look at this. Good God. This is a fucking bloodbath. It's crazy. This is the best match and it's not close. I mean, they have obviously, they've either hard way themselves on the side of the head or they've gigged themselves on the side of the head. I don't know what. Yeah. They're, they're, um, they're blading their ears. And and as I said, that was a real like serious injury here too. Okay. We're, uh, it it wasn't a pay-per-view, but, uh, was there a wrestling observer back then? Uh, I think Dave was, was messing around, but it wasn't, wasn't what it is now. So it wasn't a bunch of thumbs up, thumbs down. Like you have. In the no, other... I, I can't go to the, the archive and pull okay. something from 83. Wow. By the way, this j- has to go. Go ahead. Wow. Did you see over the weekend, um, in the MMA world, Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell both came out of retirement to fight in an MMA fight in California under Oscar De La Hoya's Golden Boy Promotions banner. No, I wouldn't watch an MMA event at, at gunpoint. Well, I thought you would appreciate this. Tito Ortiz is not known for being uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer, shall we, shall we say? Okay. And at the weigh ins on Friday, as he's putting his pants on, he says, I hope everybody had a good Easter. <laughs> as he's putting his pants on. Yeah. Hope everybody had a good Easter. <laughs> oh, God. That had to make the rounds on social media. Oh, it did. Of course. Oh, good God. Look at the blood here. Holy shit. Look at this. This actually looks like a car wreck, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at the, the, the canvas and just the mass of humanities and the chains around the necks and mouths and blood from everywhere. It's a I brutal, know. brutal match here. No wonder your hepatitis was running rampant. And what about staph infection? Jesus. Dude, Primitive. I mean, you know, back in the day. A lot of the old school guys would, would wash each other's backs after the matches, because you're going to be out here taking bumps and other people's blood all night. And if you've got any sort of cut or whatever, and you're sweating everywhere, I mean, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to get, you're going to get sick. It's not like they're swapping out canvases every night. Like they do between commercial breaks on raw. Uh, hang on. They, they swap out canvases on commercial breaks on raw. Yeah. You should go to a wrestling show sometime. No, I'm going to pass. Uh, wow. Well, you know what? Not a bad idea. They can afford to do it and they don't want anybody to get sick and good for them. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. So he's just going to wrap the chain around his head and watch him just reach over with his right hand and poke him in the forehead with it. Here he goes, wrapping it around and boom. Well, I saw that one coming. Holy shit. Well, all of our uh, listeners on what happened when you are seeing truly one of the goriest matches I've ever witnessed in my life. Speaking of gory, I'm sure you saw a couple of weeks ago, David Arquette found his way into a death match with a right. uh, former prisoner, Nick Gage, who, uh, did a stint for bank robbery and is now back in his element, uh, doing death matches. And he's, and, uh, like an underground sensation and your old friend, David Arquette wound up getting stabbed in the neck with a light tube. It's come out and said that, man, this death match stuff's not for him, but Roddy Piper getting a win in a dog collar match here is for him. Did you see the clip of David Arquette getting jacked up? I did not, but I, I read about it. What say you? I say he needs to stay away from that shit. 
It's not like working a WCW match, I can tell you that. Look at this. Oh, fuck. That hurts my neck. Absolutely hurts my neck. Just to watch that. Bang, down goes Stu Schwartz. Baby face goes over, he'll get the heat afterwards. Well, I would give this, uh, how many stars would you give this, Conrad? What would you give it if you were Dave Meltzer? Uh, four. Yeah, every bit of four. Every bit of force could, God. You know, here's a, here's another thing to keep in mind, too. This is, bef this is before, and I know they talk about it, and I know they probably talked about this match because of the, the significance of it being Starcade. But, you know, there's a lot of just improvisation going on here. You know, as far as they don't, they're not going out and rehearsing before the, the show. No one did that back then. Right. So, it, you know, pulling on the neck and all that shit, they're just probably just winging it here. Wow. How do you follow that? I on, guess with Steamboat and, uh, and the Briscoes. Jay Youngblood against the Briscoes. We haven't talked about the Briscoes a ton here. Most everybody holds Jack in the highest of regards. Uh, how much time did you spend with Jack and what can you tell us about him? Jack was a uh, Jack was a great man. And I, I say that because Jack and Jerry, and I spent a lot of time at the backstage area with them. Jerry did most, Jerry did most of the talking. He did all the talking on the promos when they would work together. But Jack was like, just, just laid back, just a great man. What had great sense of humor, always had time, always had a cigarette by the way, but always had time for you. Uh, and was uh, just a, I, I thought he was a gentleman. How? And of course, you know, I, I can remember Jack Briscoe as world champion. Right. And, uh, you know, back then when you were a, when you had the, when you had one time at the NWA belt, you were kind of like, I don't know, you were, I, I'm not going to say godlike, but you were royalty. You know, he was royalty. Gene Kaniski, who, by the way, is going to be the referee in the flare match here. Uh, Dory Funk Jr., uh, Terry Funk. They were all royalty. And here I am with the baby face, Ric Flair. Look at the scars on his head. This is your third time in the back with him tonight. Yeah, I know. I guess I should tell everybody coming up uh, here on what happened when we're going to review another one of Flair's big moments. It's going to be Starcade 1993. 10 years later, he's going to be taking on the man they call Vader. What a story you guys told that night. And it too, just like this episode, 10 years prior featured a lot of out of the ring interviews with him and including going to the house and meeting the family and the whole deal. Starcade 83 versus 93. What do you think? What's more significant for flair? Wow. Uh, look, I'm, I'm tainted. I'm going to say 83. I don't think and I'm, I know Starcade '93 was a bigger audience, and I get that it was more nationwide. This was basically, this was basically a big event for the Carolinas, is all this was. Uh, but to me, this was the beginning of Ric Flair being Ric Flair. Maybe not. This is going to be the second time he's won the world title. Of course, we're not right. there yet, but there you see Wahoo with the big elbow wrapped up. Man, Wahoo was a man's man, wasn't he? Yes, he was, man. He was serious, buddy. He was one of those guys, kind of like Ole Anderson, when they talked, you believed him. You believed everything he said, buddy. One of my um, favorite things is to hear Rick tell old stories about Wahoo and just what a tough bastard he was. Have you heard the story about Wahoo uh, walking for a case of beer between 
two cities. Look at Don Kernodal. Wow. Man. Don was an interesting character. I mean, Don's a good guy. And I, and I saw him, you know, at the Ole Anderson uh, roast we had a couple of years back. But Don was a, a, an interesting guy in that. I, I never thought he had that much charisma, but people loved him in the Atlantic Territory. He looks like um, Dave Hancock with hair. <laughs> oh, which, which, which reminds me about Hancock. Before we get this match underway. No, let's not talk about Hancock. Can I say this thing about him? Sure. Is it going to shit on him? Because if so, yeah. please take all the time you need. Okay. How come an ugly, rotund, ball headed turd like him has such a beautiful wife? She, what happened? Um, she, she grew up working with the Navy uh, and underprivileged explains. folks. And, you know, she just felt bad for him and she just considers that as an extension of her job when she was yes. young. Yes. You know, she has a very charitable giving heart, you know, she's <laughs> raised the right way. Let's yeah, just, let's I, just we, but we were in, a, uh, we were in Cicero for our Chicago MLW show and he was there with I'm, one of his, you know, goofy ass friends. I'm sure he was. Yeah. And, uh, he showed me a picture of his wife and I went, wait, wait, bullshit. wait, wait, that's wait, not your on, wife. Hang on. What? Why are, why are my friends approaching you saying, look at my wife? I, like, I don't know. Maybe you better watch Jay Z's doing it. Now out. Hancock's doing it. I gotta, I gotta reevaluate some things. <laughs> yeah. Every time I see Hancock, I'm thinking Conrad needs to reevaluate his friends. Well, that's fair. Yeah, because Super Dave's uh, Super Dave's okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Super Dave's not okay. He's not. No, Super Dave yeah. may be the worst offender of all. He's just got you snowed. All right. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say Super Dave's okay. Uh, Matt Coon yeah. ain't worth a shit. We know Matt Coon's a turd. Okay. By and, the way, and... the internet's figuring out that Matt Coon's a turd. Have you seen the way they've just all turned on him since he's doing a podcast with Vince Russo? Yeah. Yeah, I have. It's weird, man. He, he was like over like Rover in podcasting and he's about to be excommunicated. Well, you know, you make your own bed, right? As the old cliche goes, look how good steamboat looks compared to <laughs> compared to Jay young, but look at, uh, Jack Briscoe, man. He would just. You know what I was thinking about today? No, but I bet you're going to tell us. Yeah, I am. Uh, there was this in the backstage area one day when we were doing promos and the Briscoes were doing promos as a tag team. Uh, they had a fish. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? They <laughs> I just, this is no lie. I'm ready. And, and I didn't understand. It. And they had this fish and every promo, the, the, uh, the Briscoes would come out and Jerry would do all the talking, would hold up this fish. And he said, take a look at this fish. He said, there is not a fouler smelling thing in the world than this fish. Okay. And apparently there was a girl. In the Mid-Atlantic area, his last name was Fowler. My goodness. And he would say, he would come out and he would do one for Greensboro. It's not a Fowler-smelling fish. And Gene Anderson would say, don't say that. You shouldn't talk like that about that girl. <laughs> so if you ever saw that, that's what the, the rib was about that. And when I was uh, going through these matches today, I, I, I started thinking about that Fowler-smelling fish. So use your imagination from then on out. So I got it. Okay. <laughs> you, as soon as I said, Oh, I knew where you were going right away. Like, Oh man, <laughs> what is wrong? What, what have we done? What have we become in our lives that you knew what it was right away? Well, cause it's you. Like if it was my mom, oh, yeah, it's me. It, I didn't bring the damn fish out. No, but you brought it up like you're over Jerry here. Jerry Briscoe brought Jerry Briscoe 
brought the fish out. Oh, it was Jerry, not Jack who did it. Yes. It was Jerry, not Jack. I love him more. <laughs> By the way, let me just tell you, uh, he has made quite the impression on my comedian friends. Wait, they got to hang yeah. out with him in LA a couple weeks back. And to this day, they're still texting me about him. Really? Yeah. They met everybody in wrestling through being my friend, but the person they're still talking about the most, Jerry Briscoe, Jerry Briscoe, without question. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen, uh, Jerry. I don't know when the last time I, I saw him, but I saw him like, well, this was after I left the WWF and of course he was an agent back then. And, uh, I left the WWF in 89 and then maybe about three or four years later, I, I don't know. I was, you know, I, I lose and gain weight all the time. I, he saw me in the back and I never will forget him looking at me. He said, man, you've become quite the fat ass. <laughs> oh said, my God. I said, yes, I have Jerry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gerald Briscoe. That's so awesome. They were great performers though, man. You know that they both were. Dude, that makes me so happy that he just was just willing to run around and shit on people like that. <laughs> yeah, but they were, they were, they were quite the performers, man. Angelo Mosca, the special referee with a pro wrestling illustrated, uh, shirt on. Of course you can see Angelo not going to be doing much. He kind of walked from one rope to the other. My name is Angelo Mosca. My wife, Carol, she's a flight attendant. I don't have my, Oh, what are you going to do? What, what is that? What are you going to try to do? Bill? He fuck with him all the time. He didn't like to fuck with Angelo Mosca and Paul Orndorff all the time. Orndorff. I could see, yeah. you know, Angelo came across as, uh, it came across as a, as, as a badass, but in, in real life, he was just kind of a like old teddy bear. Do you ever see the thing where they were celebrating the, uh, the great cup championship and Jim cap or Joe cap came out and slapped him? No, that's uh, that's on YouTube. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Angelo with a cane and everything and, and they got into a fight. Wow. So I don't know if it's real or not. You never know what, what's real anymore. What is isn't. you think everything, everything in MMA is real? No. Everything in UFC is real. Uh, the MMA yeah. and UFC are the same thing. Okay. I believe, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm one of those guys who thinks that quote unquote, everything's a work. Yep. But I do believe that if there's money tied to it, uh, well, it's a hell of a motivator. We'll say that. Of course it is. That's why I've never believed everything I've seen in boxing. Look at Steamboat, man. Steamboat could do a lot of great shit. And of course, he was stuck there with Jay Youngblood. You really, really don't like Jay Youngblood. No, I didn't like him at all. He's no longer with us, is he? Yeah, he did. So is that why you're, you're shitting on him? No, I was shitting on him because he wasn't nice to me. When everybody to a man, to a man was nice to me, he was the one dickhead. One. Isn't that amazing? If you think about it. You would think there would be more than one that'd been a dickhead to me, but there was one. Sure. I mean, I'm a dickhead to you. So I would, well, be, I would be the one now, but, but you know, I'm also in the same, <laughs> I'm in the same category as super Dave and Dave Hancock. And no, you're not showing any pictures of your wives. <laughs> uh, and can you believe Dave, Dave Hancock was a policeman? Not for real. He was like a fake police officer. Really? It was like a gimmick. Yeah. He got a badge like on Amazon or something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's the quickest way to be one, I guess. Sure. Yeah. That's probably what his wife thought too. You know, she probably thought she was marrying a police officer. Right. She didn't realize. <laughs> womp, womp, womp. Anybody. Any, and I'm like, this is the last thing I'm going to say about hand, hand dick. Thank you. Anybody that has a Chicago Cubs tattoo on his calf muscle is a fucking idiot. Is a fucking idiot. Absolutely. 
Does he make hey, Jack Briscoe in the twilight of his career here could still go, buddy? You know, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed uh, learning about Jack Briscoe is, you know, as you said, he is sort of in the twilight of his career, but he was very much a guy who just did things on his terms. Did he not? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Tell everybody the yep. famous story. Cause I, again, we, I know we've got a lot of nitro era listeners, the famous okay. story about, uh, Jack Briscoe when he was the world champion and how it all came to an end. See, I don't know that story. You well, tell us. Apparently he never knew where he was in any different town that he woke up in. He'd have to check the airline tickets because he was traveling as the NWA world champion so often. And one day, uh, when he finally decides enough is enough, he threw his watch in the uh, ocean and was done. I'm, I'm done. So he got put in this meat grinder and then, you know, it's this great honor and great privilege to be the NWA world champion. And then I've had enough. I'm done. Right. And you know, that's just, and I'm sure I butchered that story, but the, there's a lot of different examples of Jack doing what Jack wanted to do, you know, whether sure. that was selling Georgia championship wrestling on the, the black Saturday that everybody still talks about or whatever it was, Jack was going to do what Jack wanted to do. And I just think there's something super cool about that. Yeah. His own man forge his own way. Don't let anybody affect what he's going to do, but you do realize that. And this is all a part of that. Be, being the NWA world heavyweight champion was a great demand on you. Oh, for sure. How could it yeah. not be? Because you, I mean, you didn't have a territory basically. You had a road trip every, I mean, you had no home base unless, you know, they lived in Florida. They lived in the Tampa area. We had Steamboat. Steamboat had some Steamboat's ability. You couldn't teach, man. It was just kind of a, You know, we're, we're talking a lot about, uh, we've said there's so many times in, in matches that we've seen before that fans are sitting on their hands. Right. Uh, it it kind of looks like fans are sitting on their hands here, but they really are not. Fans are really into this. And I know a lot of fans in the Mid-Atlantic Territory that hated the Briscoe brothers, man. And of course, as much as they hated them in Mid Atlantic, they were very popular in Florida. I was, uh, I think I've told this story before. Look at this. I told this story before. Uh, when I started watching wrestling in the 70s, I would watch wrestling with my uncle John Tuttle. And uh, I would, I would, uh, I would uh, work at the Craigsville IGA on Saturdays. I walked back up the hill to where uh, my uncle John lived, right down from our house, and eat lunch with him and watch Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling. And that's how I became a fan. He lived in Florida for a long, long time prior to that, and he loved Jack and Jerry Briscoe. Loved them. Everybody in Florida loved them. And uh, so I went to work for the Crockett's, and I remember the first thing I asked Francis, I said, Could you give me a picture of Jack and Jerry Briscoe? And they signed it to my Uncle John Tuttle, and I gave it to him, and it was like one of the greatest moments ever for him. And uh, my Uncle John used to always say, I'm going to see you on TV one day. I'm going to see you on TV. I know I'm going to see you doing that wrestling. And uh, he died in August of this year, of 1983. Wow. He missed it. Two months before I was ever on TV. So you failed him. You were Shivani and even sure back did. then. I sure did. That's a cool story about him though, man. Yeah. It's fun to, uh, to hear about the fan, Tony Schiavone. Yeah. Well, he still is. And it's a fan that you brought back, buddy. You Conrad Thompson brought him back. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Notice, you know what I was thinking about here too? Steamboat did a lot of great shit here. But he wasn't all gimmicked up here. I mean, think about the steamboat with the dragon and the breathing of fire and all that shit. And he just kind of walked out in this match, just a guy with black tights on. Letting the work speak for it. 
Exactly. He didn't, Everything he did he looked did, so real. He didn't need all that shit. No, he didn't. Look at that. Pick him up, spin him around. At this point, wow. is he married to Bonnie yet, or is he still with his first wife? He's still with his first wife here. Now, we've heard all the crazy stories about Bonnie. Is the first wife crazy, don't, too? No, I don't think so. Well, they're all crazy, aren't they? Well, I know old Cooter Scooter is. Yeah, there's all of them are crazy, just different levels of it. You know, I would worry about us offending some of our female listeners, but. They're crazy, too. Well, but they don't exist. Oh. Like, we know we have some female. We have a, we do have female listeners. Like six we have, of them. Brandy from Alaska is a big fan of ours. You know that? Oh uh, uh, yeah, of course I do. Okay. And she's probably crazy too, but again, though, she's in Alaska. She, she's a yeah. fan of ours because there's literally nothing else to do. <laughs> what the, what are they doing here? Oh, shit. All right. Well, they attacked uh, the referee, uh, and he's getting some retribution. Yeah, he is. I guess. And this has turned into a big clusterfuck. Uh, that's right. Do the Wahoo War Dance. Fuck, are you not even an Indian? All right. Well, only one more match to go. What is that? Way to turn your phone down. And the young blood and the steamboat, they do it. They beat yes, the sir. Briscoes. I love those old tag team straps. I probably associate that design. I don't know why, but I associate it with the Rock and Roll Express the most. But what a cool old school belt that was. Yeah, I, I associate those belts. Uh actually with the Anderson brothers more, more than anything else, but that's just, there's that uh, guy who fixed Dusty's car again out in the stands. There you go. World tag team champs. It was at that arena where Paul Jones and Ricky steamboat in 1978 became world tag team champions in a one night tournament. And the Briscoes were in that tournament as well. Good stuff. I'm looking forward to, uh, the next match here. Well, yeah, it's one of the, uh, one of the most talked about matches ever. And I guess you're going to see, uh, is, doesn't the family come to the ring after the end of the match? I think Beth does. Beth does. So there you see a credit right in the middle <laughs> throwing Jim Crockett up there. Yeah. And there's David. David's a good guy, isn't he? The best. Yeah, he's just genuine as he can be. I have no idea who Patrick Hubbard is. I don't remember him. I remember Toby Jenkins being a longtime uh, director. There's Emerson Lawson. David and I were talking about Emerson the other day. Passed away recently. Emerson was a was a good guy. So we'll zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, and zoom in. Uh, oh, I know who Howard Caldwell was, though. And, of course, the one and only Wayne Daniel. Hmm. It's probably like a, a bit of a flipping through an old high school yearbook here for you right now, is it not? Oh, yeah. And he, Brenda was uh, worked on electronic race. She also worked in the... In the bookkeeping keeping department for Jim Crockett Promotions. Look at that. Look at the look at the, uh, Doug Dellinger was a cameraman there. How about that? It's kind of fun. <laughs> I didn't know that's how you spelled his name. Yeah, it is. Larry McGraw was a uh, former Charlotte police officer. Jim Harwell was the concessions manager at Crockett Park, where I worked, the baseball park. So lighting was by a bunch of guys who did audio for a living. 
That makes sense. Yeah, it does. And there, I guess we did have the Nemo truck back in. I said we didn't have a truck back then, but I guess we did. Nemo was the, the truck that the Crockett's owned, the production truck. We're used to you lying to us, Tony. It's no big deal. Yeah. I wasn't lying there, Conrad. I just didn't remember. It was 30. Let's go back to Bob Cottle. Got that eighth grade science That's fair much, off man. a steep special. That's too much. And we can't even, we can't even frame it right. Oh, he's probably got the audio guys shooting it. <laughs> That's right. I mean, just take a half step back, Bob. And, but we got to get that star cave. Even the brown wall behind. Okay. Get him ready now. All right. Tell me about this room. Uh, it's owned by a private collector in North Carolina. He bought it on eBay like, uh, 20 years ago, 19 years ago for less than a high end vacuum cleaner, I believe. And who was uh, selling it? Was Flair selling it on eBay? No, absolutely not. Flair just learned what eBay was about five years ago. And now let's go to the very, very attractive Tony Schiavone. Oh, Charlie Brown, the TV champ. <laughs> <laughs> there's the kiss there's the kiss man the kiss that don't miss my mom loved that bless you god bless her i feel like there's been just way way too many backstage interviews in this yeah there has been but you know that was a dusty thing look at this holy shit Yeah, he's saying zoom in here, man. You know, people ask me all the time about the greatest interviewers ever. And obviously, Flair, Cornette, Arn Anderson, but Roddy Piper is in that that class too. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, and the thing about Roddy, at least to me, was Uh it was his delivery it was his enthusiasm it was his spirit more so than say you know his what con- he had to say his content yeah yeah right i agree and that's how he approached his match that that was that was everything about it i mean i i can remember seeing on an old tnt do you remember seeing the old tnt skit at roddy piper's house at halloween yes tremendous Absolutely tremendous. Here's a guy who couldn't talk for the fuck. Your favorite. Yeah. Steamboat could baby face it up though. You know what? I think I was now that I think about it, 1980, I think I was 190 pounds back then. Why do you know that? Cause my weight has fluctuated like every 10 years or whatever. Fat up, fat down. At one time I weighed 157 pounds. I did too. I think I was like 10 years old though. (laughs) Yeah. Well, as you can see, our Conrad, are in here, the anticipation is building to this big main event matchup. You guys are taking forever to put the cage up, I bet. Exactly. <laughs> and one would think that Klondike Bill's involved in putting the cage up as well. But he's probably chewing panties instead. I'm, so. sure he's, I'm sure he's had his nose and plenty of crotches by the time this show's over. That's a weird thing to say. Well, it is, but he was a weird guy. You know, the, uh, the, the fish that we were talking about with Jerry. Klondike would have loved stuff like that. You should be ashamed. Ah, These these guys got so much camera time. You think it was me and Jr. on here. Well, this is what you wanted to do. You wanted to cover it. So here we are. 
Well, we, you know, that we, we, there's a lot of people that had requested this. A lot of our uh, 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 fans, uh, friends on Patreon had requested, you know, they said, you know, and you know, it, it's funny though, Conrad. And since we started doing this, uh, podcast and since the, the network and we do all the watch alongs, we've gotten a lot of people interested in the old Jim Crockett stuff that weren't interested in. I've talked to a lot of people that said, I grew up a WWF guy, but now thanks to you guys, I'm, I'm really interested in the Jim Crockett stuff. Yeah. That's our bad. <laughs> oh, we, sh- we shouldn't be doing that to people. No, this is good shit, man. Compared to what? Well, compared to, okay. I'd rather watch this and watch what's going to be on raw on Monday night. Well, you? fuck. Everybody would rather do that. Okay. I thought you were going to smart off and say, you'd rather watch this than ECW. And I was going to hang up on you. No, I wouldn't say that. I love the ECW stuff. There you go. But there's a lot of shit on TV. Oh, look, here's a lot of bull. Come on. Three, two, one. Get off camera. <laughs> they pitched and they were still in their thing. They pitched and they said, no, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. So I had to start talking again. We may be witnessing one of the longest on cameras ever. What? You want to do a voiceover for it? You want to do Gordon? Yeah, I'll do Gordon. And <clears throat> well, I snuck in about five gin bottles, uh, from the airlines today to getting here. <clears throat> and I just like to say that, uh, I just told them they could pay me in liquor and I would be fine here today. And I would go to Malio's and I would be just fine. And I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm really the top wrestling announcer in the world, Bob Cottle. And I have no idea why they have me stuck here with you. And what's that kid's name down there? Tony Shaboni. I brought Bob or Clary with me and I thought she was going to do the interviews, but they got that Shaboni kid down there. Right, Bob? Well, that's exactly right. And uh, I'll tell you this somewhere at home. Old Dick Bourne is really masturbating to this show. Isn't that right, Gordon? Well, yeah, I understand that. That's what Dick Bourne masturbates about. And you know, he has a friend of his that is actually a district attorney somewhere and who watches wrestling too. <laughs> That's right. He watches this shit. Let's go to the fucking ring. Another well, dusty promo. <laughs> Another dusty promo. This time with three ladies in the crowd. One of which looks like she could be Lois's twin. <laughs> which one would that be? <laughs> well, you married her. I'll let you figure it out. Oh, Ric Flair. Who going to win, girls? Who going to win? Ric Flair, they're all saying Ric Flair. Well, because they're, they're not idiots, right? No. You know, Conrad, we've got about 50 minutes to go. I don't remember them going 50 minutes. It's like a 23 minute match. We've got 27 more minutes of this. Wow. All right. Well, <laughs> here we are again. We're back. And, uh, Dick Bourne is, is doing bets now with David Chappell over at midatlanticgateway.com to see how long this will last before Conrad decides to turn the show off. Gordon, what do you think? Well, I would, I absolutely, uh, I, I would agree. And. Uh, and I would think that we'll see a bunch of vertical suit plays and Dave Chappell and, uh, Dick Bourne, as we know, are two of the biggest slap dicks in the world. We even know them down in Florida. We have a lot. He pulled the microphone. Well, open. here's what we've got. Uh, they've got the, the cage set up and they've got trucking Jim Miller down there. I feel like you guys have probably shared a drink or two. Let's throw it to Jim. Uh, who in the fuck is this and turn the lights back up. They're they're in the pitch black and it's a recording artist, a North Carolina native, James tiny weeks. Uh, Yeah. So they're going to, uh, turn everyone, turn all the lights down so you can light the American flag and what looks like my stunt double can sing the national anthem here at this point. Do you think Gordon was taking pulls off of some gin in the back? Well, Uh, Ole Anderson told me the story one time that, uh, the Crockett's wanted, uh, them to wanted only to bring Gordon up from Georgia with him to the show that they were going to have him do. Uh, I don't think it was this show could have been. And he, and, uh, Jim Crockett told Ole Anderson, he said, Ole, I want you to bring him here and I want you to make sure that he does not drink. 
I want him sober for this event. And Oli said, I, I stayed with him the entire time. We stopped in. We got something to eat. And I didn't te- see him take one drink at all. He said, but by the time we got to Charlotte, he was drunk. And he said, and I realized, found out that he had these small bottles of gin that he got from the airlines. He stuck it in his pocket and he would go to the bathroom or we would stop and he would, and that's what he would do. So, um, that was a, that was a, a, a rousing introduction, wasn't it? And now we're in total, we are, <laughs> we are in total darkness right now. We are completely dark. <laughs> this is going to drive me to drinking. <laughs> oh, whew. Thank God for the disco ball, huh? Quick, someone d- d- turn on some light. And there it's back to dark again. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. Flash of lights. Ooh. Yeah. Word, black, <laughs> black. Somebody turn on the fucking light. What the fuck? Well, I just have to say that uh, TV wrestling has gotten a little bit better in 35 years. You think? think? How long is this darkness going to be? God. Okay, they had... I guess they had these laser effects that they wanted to put on TV, but it didn't work. Good God. <laughs> this is just building the excitement, Conrad, to an all time fever pitch. Okay. Come on out, Rick. Jesus Christ, come out. I don't believe what I'm watching here. Yep. We have had now for the national anthem, which takes about two minutes. There you go. Finally, there's some light for that explosion. We have had on this telecast almost four minutes of darkness now. And now there's flare. There's a famous shot we've seen a lot of, haven't we? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a cool robe. It is. Super old school. Thirty-five years ago, man. Can you believe it? No. I, you know what? It, and this is trite to say this, I guess. And but and I, there's a, a famous shot I've seen a lot of too. Flair coming through the fans. Uh, but it just it seems like yesterday in many ways. It really does. Is that Bruce Mitchell with a hat? Look at his Klondike. You see him right there on the right screen. We're on the Klondike bill. I knew he'd be around. Now they say, they say, I've been told, and I think maybe Tommy Young told us this. Didn't they screw up the finish of this match? Have you heard that story? No. Yeah. The finish was, was Flair coming off the top, right? Or roll him up or something. Yeah. Cross body rolled up. Cross body. That was not supposed to be the finish. They, the finish, they actually screwed up what was supposed to be the actual finish, and the crossbody was what they came up with on the fly. Now, what the actual finish was, I don't know, but I've been told many times that the actual finish of the match, we can need to talk about that, this. That, that was not supposed to be the actual finish. But again, you know, you, you don't, you, you're back in old school. You're, you're not uh, choreographing everything. You're not practicing. You're not going out and rehearsing shit you just gotta kind of go things on the fly i wish it wasn't so late i just call and ask and there's the champ it's pretty cool that wwe owns that harley race robe they show it off every year at access around wrestlemania yeah I heard through the grapevine that, uh, earlier this year, someone stole Harley races commemorative world title. 
What? I know. Who the fuck steals from Harley Race? Like, Would you like to, not like to find that person and beat the fuck out of them? Yes. He's, I mean, he's the nicest old dude ever. And if you're a wrestling fan, the idea that you would <coughs> steal from Harley race, is just fucking awful. Yeah. You will burn in hell for that. I can tell you that you absolutely burn in hell for it. Wow. Now we have, uh, we have been, okay. We have been almost what, what I say about 20 minutes. Between the, the end of the match? steamboat match? Yeah, it's been a while, man. It's really dragging. This is this is not gonna work out to be our most fun podcast just because this show is not fun to cover. Yeah, it's okay. There's uh, Gene Kaniski, the uh special referee, old Wally Dusick, who was the, the timekeeper. Wally was a pretty good guy, had these big old cauliflowered ears. Wally used to tell me, because I used to do some ring announcing, and Wally would step beside me, Wally would say. These wrestlers can be son of a bitches if they tell you to call them by a certain name and it's not what the promoter told you to call them. You tell them to, to fuck no, you're not going to call them that. You're only going to call them what the promoter to. I'm thinking, wow, man. Well, this had quite a, uh, this had quite a feel to it. This has a big match feel for sure. Yeah. A flair for the gold. Woo. <laughs> Didn't that name tell you that the title was going to switch anyway? Of course it did. Which is why yeah. even those chicks earlier were like flair, flair, flair. Yeah. Well, this was mid Atlantic territory too, but I never did get the fact that this match was had so much, uh, so much writing on it. Why Tommy young didn't, referee the match. I don't, uh, I don't know the story behind that. Well, because they're trying to have uh, the extra attraction. Do you know who the referee is here? Yeah. It's Gene Kaniski. Well, that's a big deal. No, no. Really? Fine. Fuck it. No, <laughs> it's not Conrad. I mean, it's not to the people in the mid Atlantic area. And this again, this is not a national pay-per-view event. This is, yes, it this is, is it's uh, on closed circuit. People are coming to the, the theater start. to see it. Yeah, to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Spartanburg, uh, Greenville, South Carolina, probably to Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte. Well, then why'd they put Abdul the Butcher on it? Why'd they put Carlos? Again, I think I, I think I mentioned that because they were. Why did they the have tape? three Dusty Rhodes shits? Because he's booking it. Okay, well, you said, uh, never mind. There's the belt. Can I just tell you that, uh, me and all my friends are going to come mess with you during the game Saturday. You're not allowed up there. Oh, you don't know where I'm allowed to go. Yeah. If anybody can get their way up to the press box, it would be you. I, here's <laughs> what I've learned. Here's a little pro tip for you. Okay. If you're wearing a suit and you look like you're supposed to be there, nobody says shit. <laughs> just put a suit on, walk fast, confidently. No trepidation. Yeah. You're in there. Like swim- that. You're in there like swimwear. The odds are the security officers at Mercedes Benz stadium. They know, they know me over there. Yeah. They see you come. They say, Hey, we love your podcast. Now they're just like, Oh, look, he's here again. Roll tide. <laughs> you know, we just beat the fuck out of y'all over there all the oh, time. I, I, I won't uh, remember his name. I think his name was John, but I was down the Caymans and, uh, Creighton's basketball team was in that tournament and the play-by-play guy for Creighton came up and says, love the podcast. Tell Conrad. I love him. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. Bruce and I, you know, we did our show at Russell K and Winston Salem about every other person who came through the VIP line. Was it mine and your show in Charlotte two weeks ago? Wow. So it was kind of was- fun. I remembered a bunch of those dudes. Yeah. We got, uh, we got, there's great fans all around. Yeah. And it, you know it, what? They're really glad that you're back, man. They really I'm are. Why am I back? Go ahead. What are you, well, you're back for the money. You're no. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Forget, forget. I asked you. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was funny. Fuck you. I'm back because of you, motherfucker. And the money. And the money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we got an old school wrestling match going on here. Going to do a little feeling out process, a couple of side headlocks, maybe hit the ropes a couple of times. Referee calling for the break. Oh, champion won't get a break. There's your side headlock. You look at Bill after down at ringside with all that hair on his head. Jesus. And who's the other photographer? George Nalapatano. Yeah. George Neapolitan, as you called him. Really. <laughs> George Neapolitan. <laughs> For the purposes of my story, his name from now on is George Neapolitan. George Neapolitan, how you doing? Hey, I'm George. How you doing? Absolutely. Without question. <laughs> You're back. Why am I back for the money? It's not all about money. Is it? No. Oh, by the way, my our buddy, who uh, who's one of our low-key big hogs on Patreon. By the way, you can join us on patreon.com forward slash WHW Monday. But uh, one of the... Uh, one of our Patreons, uh, Paul Bromwell, you know, Paul, you met Paul in Philadelphia. I met him this past weekend. He was at WrestleCade. Right. He sent me a video that I haven't watched yet. He did a video with he and uh, Francine. And I've yet to watch it. I saw it and came in the other day and I was you, just kind of tied up. You're going to wait and watch it when uh, Lois is out of the house? Yes, I am. I'm going to watch it in the bathroom. What I was told, can I share or do you want to keep that? Just between us. You can share it. Go ahead. So <laughs> what Tony told me was his move is to lock the front door, lock the garage door. <laughs> Wait a minute. Whoa, stop. What? I thought you, I thought you could tell me something that Paul told you. This is something I told you. Yes. Oh, that you would get in the den. <laughs> and you get th- and you get your pants down around your ankles and you get three pillows under your right elbow <laughs> and you'd have like a little thing of tissues. And I forget what type of lotion was it you were telling me. I don't remember the you brand. So I don't remember the brand. And then put the Francine video on. Is that what you're saying? And then, you know, roll tide. Hey, so let me ask this, uh, and I don't know why this makes me laugh, but is the Buffalo bill thing that I did a few weeks ago, still something you're getting tweets about. I feel like every time I log into Twitter, there is another Photoshop of me as Buffalo bill. When I talked about the, uh, you know, from silence of the lambs, where I talked about the gag you pulled on me at the house where you. I came out of the bathroom and your pants were down and you tucked your franken beans between your legs. Where you and I did the voice that you love so much. <laughs> Good God. By the way, I'm, Ms. Getting, Mrs. I'm so miss fucking represented that it's <laughs> Mrs. Thompson laughs out loud. Every time I play that clip for her and let her hear me do the voice, do the voice for me. Go ahead. No. Cause here's the deal. You've hyped it up now. So it won't be as good. I'll okay. just, I'll just hit you with it when you're not ready <laughs> and it'll still keep its comedic effect. Oh God. By the way, we're talking, we're talking about this when Rick Flair's wrestling Harley race in one of the classic matches of all time. Well, they're doing a 44 minute, um, headlock. Hey, you know, what's interesting to me, Flair, who is so meticulous about his, his, his outfits, for lack of a better word, his presentation, Mm -hmm. his boots here are beat to shit. Flair later would be, if it's a big match, I'm going to have a new robe. I'm going to have new boots. I'm going to have new knee pads, new tights. I mean, he would coordinate the whole outfit for the big shows much like his daughter does now, you know, WrestleMania, she's got a new robe. 
SummerSlam, she's got a new robe, things like that. But here, Rick's boots are just beat to shit, man. And they're green, right? Yeah. So they're, they're not nearly the attention to detail that you would see years later. And I don't know why that, I don't know if it's because, you know, Clifford Macias, his bootmaker was just behind or. Well, uh, here's a thought. He's probably years later making a lot more money. He could afford to a lot different robes, a lot different. You, you know boots. what? I just confused my matches. These boots are not beat to shit. They just don't match. Like what you said, I'm colorblind. Yeah. So I had to actually see them up close. I just remember thinking something was fucked up about his boots, but like, yeah. I didn't know they were not the same color until you pointed that out. But now that I see yeah. the boots up close, I realized, no, they're good. They're, they're in good shape. That just means they, they can't match. Yeah. They don't match at all. They, they look out of place. Yeah. So, so again, you know, uh, as you move on and Ric Flair, you know, I, I know Rick, obviously Ric Flair was making a lot of money back then, but oh, yeah. it was nothing like he was getting ready to make. So. Sure. I kind of blame you. I kind of blame you for all this. <laughs> of course you do. Why? Well, co- I wanted to sh- I'm colorblind. Okay. That's your fault. So now you're colorblind. Do you see everything in black and white? Um, no, not everything. I just found out a few weeks ago that Jay Z wasn't black. <laughs> well, that's new. Uh, when we were going out to dinner and Charlotte, what color did you think this? pineapple suit was I just knew if Jay-Z was wearing it it was fucking stupid all right no I mean like this past week no, you, you missed it but the WrestleCade he wore a flamingo suit are you serious yes there's got to be a picture online somewhere of that oh I'm sure there's a thousand and here's the deal too like he's a nice guy just dresses like a fucking idiot Wow. Harley could really put on a pile driver. Dude, Harley's power moves. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just look, everything Harley did look deliberate and impactful, whether it was an elbow, um, you know, the fist drop, the knee drop, everything looked like it hurt. Right. And he did that, that headbutt too. You know, where he would, wouldn't he do it off the top rope where he, yeah, but most of the time it was just from the mat. Right. Who do you think's calling the match here? Historically, the heels call the match, but we've also heard that flair would call it a lot, but Harley being the veteran, you think, uh, Harley's calling this one. Yeah. There's no doubt. Any crazy to think about too, just that, you know, these days, everybody sort of wants to run through what they're going to do. And man, that is not the case here. These guys are just winging it and calling it in the ring, as they say. And this is the biggest match of the night and arguably of either one of their careers, just based on the audience. Well, you know, they're, they're in the, uh, a lot of the, uh, smaller venues, they weren't even, they wouldn't even be in the same dressing room. Right. Uh, but they're obviously in the same dressing room area here in the backstage area. So this big venue. This was, this was a legendary arena. I mean, this was the, the biggest arena for Crockett promotion. So they always had big shows. And this was also the venue for the, the ACC basketball tournament back when the ACC basketball tournament meant something. And now a little bit of that flair going to the top, jabbing himself in the forehead here. What a shot, man. I love it. Look at the blood spots. It looks, it makes it feel like, remember those famous boxing images of, uh, Muhammad Ali, they were shot from above like this. That's what it makes me think of. This is someone up on the catwalk too, laying down. It has to be with one of those cameras, one of those heavy cameras on his shoulder. Wow. 
It's a wonder nobody was hurt. Yeah. Yeah, matches were different back then. I, I get it. I, I get it that, you know, we're not used to that. But, you know, I see uh, I see 20-minute matches on that we do on MLW now that, you know, you just here, – here comes a headbutt, I think. Boom. There it was. I see 20-minute matches on Major League Wrestling, MLW, that we do now that shouldn't go that long, but they do. But but again, if you, if you got two guys who can tell a story, it, it's and the fans dug it back then because they, I mean, they weren't watching the high flying, flip flying bullshit we see now. I mean, we're in the high spot era, right? It's kind of like baseball; they all want to see home runs now. Yeah. But that's not the essence of the game. The essence of wrestling is telling stories in the ring. And the story here is that Harley Race got the advantage and he's got Flair in trouble using the cage. And now can Flair come back? And he's laying it in. He's got an opening, literally. An opening. He's got to open his forehead some more. And this was, I mean, and, and the baby face, the, the baby face here, you, you got behind him and he fought from underneath and you want him to come back and he showed heart, he showed courage, he showed determination, showed all the attributes. Without question. Thank you very much. I knew somebody would say that and I feel it would be you. Whoa. You know, um, I don't think we've said Patreon enough on this show yet to annoy anybody. Okay. Well, there was a Patreon elbow right there on top of Harley's head. And Patreon. Oh, watch out. Former world heavyweight champion, Gene Patreon Kaninsky is pulling him back and, uh, falls right in the middle of the ring with those logos. P A T R E O N. Hey, give everybody a uh, time cue of where we are here on Patreon. Okay, uh, we're 26, 25, 226, 27, 28, 29, 30. I'm looking at a shot from overhead. And Harley Race just hit the other Patreon corner and falls face first. And Gene Kaniski says, hey, you know, they got videos of Lois Shimani. And they got, and Flair just reaches into Harley Race and says, yeah, and I like slapdick theater too. Ooh. And now players coming back, and here's the story they're telling. Did Flair just do a woo? If so, that was his first woo of the night. Think about how he upped his woo count as the years went on. <laughs> you know, he he's talked about that before, where he said that as his physical skills diminished, he had to up the entertainment. Right. And that's just a man who knew the business, not just necessarily the wrestling business, but the entertainment business still does. Yes, he does. You ever seen that commercial where he, he just, he's in an office building with this woman and he's wooing his ass off and dancing. And these two people are looking at him like he's fucking nut. Yeah. I think you're talking about every commercial he's ever done. <laughs> that's right. Hmm. Oh, oh my God. He's trying to break his fucking neck. This is when wrestling was presented a different way, man. It was very much presented here as an athletic competition. These guys are, are athletes and they're vying for the championship. We're a long way from putting people's moms on poles here. Yes, sir. You're exactly right, sir. And you know what? As as many lulls in the action that we've had here, no, I'll th still take this any day. This is a great match. The um, 
the Piper match is a tremendous match. I, I'm a bit of, I've become a Briscoe Mark in my later years in my advanced age. I just, I, I think a lot of the underneath stuff, eh, not very good, but these last three matches, man, outstanding. Well, are you, are you the mindset that, and I've always been this way, not every match can be a five-star match. Oh, for and sure. Gotta, but I'm just saying build some, up to it. some of the other stuff, uh, let, let me be clear. I don't ever think anything should or shouldn't be a five-star match. I'm just saying, you know, either it's entertaining or it's not like the, the, the star rating is based on, um, the work they put in and you know, a lot of other things, but the word work rate is something people throw around a lot. I'm not referencing that here at all. I'm just saying some of the stuff didn't entertain me. Like it wasn't, it wasn't good. And not all of it was horrible, but some of it was just sort of there. Yeah. And that is, that's definitely based on me, not knowing the backstory of all the characters. I didn't grow up watching it. And I know you look at it totally differently and I respect that and appreciate it. I just know that you know, it wasn't for me. So like I watch ECW stuff and little stuff is really cool to me because I know the backstory and not so much to you. You just want to look at Francine's boobs and I get it. Well, it's not only her boobs. I, yeah, she has a face too. And a, and a rear end and a very nice. Oh gosh. I'm, I'm trying to help you and you're just like, nope, let's, let's just keep going. Well, no, I'm just, I'm trying to be brutally, I'm trying to be brutally honest here about what I'm looking at when Francine comes to the ring. Look, when Francine walked to the ring, I wasn't looking at Shane Douglas, right? Nobody and was. And if Francine fairness. walks by me to where I've only seen her posterior, I wasn't going to turn to look the other way. You see? I understand. Okay. Without question. Without question. Hang on to that camera there, fella. <laughs> He's strutting a little bit. One thing that that Flair could do better than anybody else, it was fucking bleed. Nobody could bleed like Ric Flair, and I knew a lot of that had to do with that blonde hair. But uh, Flair could bleed better than anybody. Did that? Did that tell you about my mom asking him about that? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She had to ask. What did she, what, what, what did she ask? You know, my mom Why did you bleed so my much? My mom doesn't or? know anything about wrestling. You know what I mean? Okay. Like she, she knows I'll right. watch it. She doesn't know anything though. Right. right. So Lord, didn't that hurt? Goodness gracious. Why did you do that? Just, you know, normal, well-adjusted human thought when you're first explained how right. that, cause she's asked. How did y'all do that? Cause I know that on TV, it was a blood capsule or whatever, right? It's ketchup. <laughs> and then of course he's like, Nope, I was Dr. Flair. <laughs> and just the, 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 to explain it to someone who, you know, in their free time, watches the TV show touched by an angel. <laughs> and now you have to explain <laughs> what this is. Yeah. Well, wow. Well, you know, to the, uh, the uneducated wrestling fan, we all thought it was blood capsules up until I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm backstage watching this thinking it's blood capsules. No, I get it. Listen, I think, I think that was a common thread that a lot of people talked about, which is why. When they did that John Stossel thing, um, you know, they talked about, there ain't no such thing as a blood, blood capsule with, uh, yeah. Eddie Mansfield. Right. I think, I think a lot of people learned from that, that, oh, wait, maybe not. Yeah. Because if someone would have told us, no, it's not a blood capsule. They actually cut their forehead. We would have said, no, they don't. Who in the world would do that shit? Right. Exactly. But it, I think it's a natural thing too to just assume dragging a razor across your head has to be horribly painful. Well, I've got, I was talking about the stack of pictures I have from uh, some of my sh with shows as a fan. I went to Greensboro 
We went down at ringside, right down to front row ringside one time after a match. I think it was Blackjack Mulligan and Harley Race. Uh, no, it was Blackjack. Who was it? It was Blackjack Mulligan against Ric Flair. And it was Dick Murdoch against Harley Race. And uh, we we went down and I thought I saw a blood capsule. So I took a picture and I brought it back to all my friends and said, see, it's a blood capsule. There's one right there. And I still got that picture. We thought it was a blood capsule. Can you put that on Patreon? Uh, yeah, I sure can. What, what I think was I know it where the pi- picture is. What was it a picture of? I have no idea, but it looked like a blood capsule. But it wasn't. No. I mean, from what I know now, I, I, I don't think it was. I mean, no one used blood capsules, did they? I mean, I'm sure it was used for like mouth stuff. You know, I know a lot of guys when they would bleed from the mouth, they would right like, like down on something. Well, they'd fill it with a condom. You know, they'd put blood in a condom and put the condom in their mouth, which I know sounds like a weekend for you, but then they would bite into it and <laughs> what well, that got you, didn't it? It's it sounds like a <laughs> sounds like a holiday to me. Tony, how were you the first time you put a condom in your mouth? Twelve. Oh Lord. I don't need to know any more. <laughs> Gonna get some James Ellsworth action over here. Stop. I'm sure you saw that, didn't you? Yes, I did. What'd you think of that? Oh God. I was heartbroken. I mean, it caught me off guard, man. I I just didn't Yeah. I don't know. I never saw that coming, didn't want to believe it. Called, yeah. called my buddy and was like, Hey man. And he's like, yeah, that's mm-hmm. legit. Wow. How about Gene Kadiski dragging Harley race by the hair? Yes, sir. Well, he's a former world champion, man. Right. See, JR I- got a couple of black eyes. Yeah. Fell down the steps. Didn't he? I think he missed the bottom step hmm. at a buddy's took a, house. Took a hell of a bump, man. Ah, uh, that's an understatement. Did you see him in, in Winston Salem? I did. He's in the He's best pro, spirit. Man. He's in the best spirits I'd ever seen him in. I've only hung out with Jr. a handful of times, but yeah, I, we had so much fun just catching up with him. Yeah, he's a he is a engaging. Funny conversationalist, buddy. It's funny that, you know, right away he's like, uh, so, uh, Hey, I heard about one of those bits you and, uh, <laughs> you and old Brucey do at your live shows at my expense. And I knew exactly what bit he was talking about and he named it, but I don't want to spoil it. And he said, somebody asked me, doesn't that piss you off? And I said, hell no, boy. Talking about JR, it's good for me. <laughs> Just totally got it. Like I'm yeah. the, I'm I'm the most parodied person in wrestling. No, it doesn't bother me. Come on. Is this our finish? There it is. Yep. Look at the fans going nuts, man. What a cool moment. I think a lot of people think that this is Flair's first world title win, but it's really not. He won an 81 in Kansas city, he beat dusty Rhodes for it. And been a lot of debate about why it was in Kansas city where neither one of those guys were really, you know, the, the main draw, but here they are Greensboro, North Carolina, the heartbeat of main Atlantic, the first super show. And it's the crowning moment that Rick is actually ready for. He said when he won it in 81, he really wasn't ready for it. But man, he's ready for it in 83 and they are giving him a hero celebration, lifting him up. Fans are going wild. Man, that belt is synonymous with Ric Flair to me. This is also a big moment for, for the fans in Greensboro, because it was something special to see a title switch. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, now they're seeing the biggest title switch. So this was a, this was a really, really a, a big deal in many ways. And, um, uh, a great moment here. You know, when you, uh, 
you talk about Flair winning the title in Kansas City. I guess it was done because Bob Geigel was the NWA president, right? And he wanted to have a switch in his hometown. That's the first thing I thought of. Hey, let me ask you. This is the first time you saw an NWA world title switch in person, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. Being a um a Mickey Mark for the NWA your whole life. Yeah. yeah. This is a big deal, is it not? You're damn right it's a big deal. When we would go to wrestling matches, we would want to see two things. We want to see a title switch, we want to see juice. You never see those at spot shows. You never saw those at the Harrisonburg High School gym or at the Augusta Expo. Hardly I saw one time in Roanoke, Virginia, but you would always see juice and title switches in Greensboro. And there you go. On Angelo Mosca's Oh, flashing that Ric Flair. <laughs> yeah, the flashing Ric Flair graphic. That's yeah. great stuff, man. So there's still about uh, 15 minutes left in the show. So what are they going to do here? He's going to do a promo. Uh -huh. And we're going to do some promo. That's in the ring. Then we're going to go backstage and do a promo with Harley Race. We'll probably look at Bob Cottle, Bob Cottle and uh, Gordon Soli for about 12 minutes. And didn't Dusty say, come to him and say, I want, I'm, I'm a world champion. You're a and, world there, world. and there is a wife. Number two, Elizabeth, who we know as Beth. Yeah. That's, uh, Charlotte's mother. Right. Uh, I heard a story about this one too. Have you heard about this? Go ahead. That he didn't want her in the ring. Well, I mean, he gave her a kiss and pushed her away. Well, <laughs> but he didn't expect her to come in the ring and didn't want her to come in the ring. That's what I was told. I believe that. Yeah. That was her own doing, or I don't know, maybe somebody put her up to this or whatever. Well, they were getting a shot of her. Yeah. That's the thing that threw me. I mean, they're getting a shot of her. A lot of these kids, I have no idea. There's Rufus Harfrey, Train Jones. There's Barry Horowitz. You see him over there? How about that? Had the glasses on and the, the jacket over on the right. They will pull out and see if we can see a shot again of him over there. Another shot of Beth. Man, what a cool belt. Yeah. That they gotten some blood on her. Great moment. Absolutely. Uh, uh, one of those moments that you, you remember your entire life. Not only if you're Ric Flair, obviously, but. There's a lot of fans still hanging around too. So as we'll get the, as you will talk in the ring here. Yep. There he goes. Yeah. And, um, long before we knew where the hard cameras were, turn around. There you go. Champ. Talk to me a little bit about this show. You know, obviously you're there for it. Did you ever watch this? Did you ever sit down and watch it? Or is this the first time since first time? What, what's your impression? I, I, I watched, I watched, I've, I've seen the Ric Flair match before. I've seen the dog collar match before, but it's been a long, long time. I haven't sat down and watched it, watch it coast to coast until you and I talked about doing it. And, and you see, you pull out the matches and you, and you see them and you think, oh, it's a great event. But then again, you know, you're right. There was some lulls like 10 minutes of darkness <laughs> that you normally don't see in a wrestling paper. Do you? By the way, whenever you keep saying darkness, I think of that Dave Chappelle skit every time you do. Oh, it's great. Have I, uh, have we talked about on the show that I sent you a Dave Chappelle skit that you had never seen that you loved? No. So 
You're you're in bullshit mode here again, too. No, I'm not. You don't remember the skit I'm talking about. No, I don't. That's disappointing. Because you laughed. <laughs> Bullshit. No, it's not. Listen. Well, your parents oh, there's Conrad Tom. No, it's My bad. mommy and daddy are at work. Oh, yeah? Well, me, I gave up working a long time ago. Don't give up, Stinky. My dad says, if you never give up and work hard, all your dreams will come true. That's the gayest shit I ever heard. What? I don't believe your pappy. <laughs> May be rich, but he ain't happy. Tells you about work and you want to be him. But when's the last time you got to see him? He works hard. Why? So you can go out and buy. A bunch of shit that you don't need Driven by your punk ass hopes and greed That's why I say fuck it <laughs> For the first time in my life I'm finally free No mansion for me I said fuck it No brand new Humvee I say fuck it but you'll get no pussy. <laughs> Fuck it. You don't understand. Is I make love to my hand. So I don't need you, honey. I beat my dick like it owes me money. Fuck it. That's right, I say. Fuck it. Oh, God. So Flair's got a promo and I'm back with you here. This is your 19th time on camera today. <laughs> That's right. And it was my most entertaining time because fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you had never seen that until I sent it the other day. Oh God. That, that, that should be your, your like, that's, that's Tony Schiavone in song form. That is. Fuck it. Okay. Makes me happy. It does. Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat and Tony Schiavone holding that long ass microphone. Let me tell you, when you've got a bunch of cuts in your forehead, pouring alcohol directly into it, probably doesn't feel good. No, I know. Never I know done it. it. Just guessing, just freestyling, but <laughs> feel pretty confident in that. <laughs> oh God. Look at. There he goes. Dusty Rhodes with his back to the camera coming in to cut off Ric Flair saying that, uh, there's only two of us. There's only yeah. one belt and there's a yeah. time coming. Of course, that's who Flair beat the first time he won the world title. How excited were you being that close to Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair as a fan? Yeah, it's, it, I'm telling you, it's one of the, it's, it's one of the highlights of my life. It really is. That makes me I got all that champagne all over me. Did you go and home and back. let Lois, uh, well, <laughs> you go bring Lois's name into this, aren't you? Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a uh, young blood. Everybody's lining up to shake the new champ's hand, but we're not done. This pay-per-view is going to keep going. Rocky Cronodo. I don't know who this kid in the plaid is. Uh, Somebody out there watching does. Yeah, I know. Rufus Hart, I'm happy. I'm smiling. Sunny Fargo, okay. Man, you, you know, you're right. There's a... Fuck a lot of talking going on on this show. It's too much, man. It's too yeah. much. Yeah. I guess they were trying to fill three hours. I, I don't know. I'm finally free. <laughs> <Fuck it. laughs> oh, every, All right, so every time so, the, uh, uh, the female voice says, and you'll get no, you crack up every time. I've never shown it to you where you didn't immediately start laughing when she ch when she chimes in. <laughs> well, 
That's what makes the world go round. <laughs> well, how does that the world? How does the world still go around for you then? <laughs> well, you know, the old saying was that guys don't worry about two things, right? Where to put their Peter and where to put their pocketbook. Well. That's what they say. I don't know if that's true. Well, well you're a guy. Where are you, what are you worried about these days? I'm worried about taking a nap. I'm worried about my dog. <laughs> I'm worried about my baseball glove. Oh my God. I yeah. love you. I love you for this. <laughs> worried about what people say about me on the internet. <laughs> I know you ain't worried about that. <laughs> worried about my friends. No, you're not. <laughs> yes, I am. No, you're not. Nah, fuck it. <laughs> I was going to say. You, you've admitted from the very first time we hung out. Now I'm not a good friend. I'm not going to like call and check on you. Yeah. I'm never going to check up on anything. I'll text you or call you when I need something. <laughs> no, it's and not then I'll true. wear your ass out. That's, that's not true. That's been my experience. When you need something, you'll wear my ass out, but otherwise that is it. not true. Fuck it. <laughs> That is not true. Hundred, the hundred percent true. Yeah, when when this gig is up for you and me, you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> I'm aware. I just the way I am. I just not that I always need something. If, just, I, if I moved into your house, it would be the exact same thing. You have the. You told me the other day you and Lois are having hallway sex, and I thought it was because of blue chew. And then you explained that that meant you just passed each other in the hall and said "fuck you, fuck you." Yeah. <laughs> Right. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, I've got this nice room above the stairs that I, that I, I, I live in now. Fuck it. Fuck it. I go in. Lois said, you and Bud going upstairs? I said, yeah, I'll see you later. I can't. And life is wonderful. I'm really looking forward to uh, being to that level of the marriage. <laughs> Fuck wow. it. There's Harley Race. What's he saying here? Uh, well, I got fucked over in Greensboro, but you look pretty sweet, sweetheart. How'd you get in the business? Did you fuck Gordon solely to get in the business? Did you fuck Eddie Graham? How about Mike Graham? Did you fuck him? How about Bugsy McGraw? Most of the females down in Florida fucked all the guys. So I was wondering if you're one of them. How'd you get in the business? Let me say this. As far as Greensboro is concerned, it's the worst place in God's green earth i'll come back and i'll get the title once again. Well, you mean i'm never going to have the title again i'm done listen if this all was a fucking shoot i'd still be the heavyweight champion of the world because next to wahoo mcdaniel i'm one of the toughest motherfuckers back here everybody else back here is a pussy but i'm one of the toughest motherfuckers in the world that's all i got that's pretty fun Fuck it. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. They still got five minutes to go in this show. We're not done. Oh my God. This is the show that never ends. This talking is Barbara looked pretty good here, man. Didn't she? I don't know what you're doing right now. She was very pretty. Uh, uh, what if Lois is listening? <laughs> Lois has been listen. Even if she's listening, she wouldn't give a shit. You know what she would say? Fuck it. I'm <laughs> going to bed. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you watch any of the old uh, in the old uh, wrestling shows from uh, Championship Wrestling from Florida. Another Barbara. Ric Flair promo. Oh, God. Again, more Tony Schiavone. This is the 19th time you've been with Ric Flair backstage tonight. Uh, and as you can see, the blood is starting to clot on Ric Flair's face. He would have taken a shower now. He would have had about, oh, uh, good God. You know, he should be going, woo, dancing, strutting, but no, he's trying to super baby face it. That's what he's been told to do. I guess he has. 
probably dusty. Setting it up, getting ready for the next one. The next arcade would be Million Dollar Challenge. He and Dusty Rhodes in Greensboro with uh, Smoking Joe Frazier, the referee. Remember that? That would be the next one. And then there was a gathering in the cage. And when they had that, uh, that, as they say, quote unquote, dusty finish. Where it looked like Dusty had won the title, left with the belt. Tommy Young said no. There was a disqualification or whatever. All right, bring the graphic in and out. I think he even thanked me there. Would you believe it if I told you I still had that tie? No, you don't. Oh, yeah, I do. We threw nothing away here in the house. Nothing. I could probably sell that tie to Dick Bourne for like, what, $1,000? No. Dick Bourne would give you a, a can of Hormel chili and an unsigned birthday card. <laughs> All right. Well, we still got a couple of minutes here. Let's go back to Bob Cottle. Gordon Sully. Well, here we are in front of the uh, eighth grade science fair that the uh, Shivani children have made. Lord, there's a lot of them. And, uh, all of a sudden Conrad's making me sound like Mr. Ed, isn't that right? Gordon. And, uh, that's okay. I mean, you still can't pronounce suplex. Am I right? That's exactly right. I would say I'm going to go back and have about 10 gins, but I've already had 10 gins in me already. That was some big number 15 through 20 or 10 through 15. I lost count. I don't know. Wow. I didn't realize how many on cameras we had. Dude, it's stupid. Oh, it is. I want to, I want to really like this. I do. Jesus Christ. Phil, 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 Phil. Oh, nothing else we can say, Gordon. You think we've been out here long enough? What the fuck is going on, Gordon? Jesus Christ, we should have been out of this a long time ago. That's true. All right, so long. There you go. He said goodbye. And you know what they were doing? One of the things they were doing? They were waiting for Wayne Daniel to put together a video package in this show. And he put together video packages just from reel to reel machine and no editing at all. In other words, no edit suite, no editing equipment, no editing software. He was putting together this entire package, and that's why they were wasting time. So he could get it together. I got you. Which, you know, now they can do it almost instantaneously. But uh, Oh, without question. Yeah. I just want to say it one more time before we were done. <laughs> I knew you would. So Wayne put together that video package. And finally, thank the Lord we're here. And you and I just talked uh, this past week about some other shows that we're going to have coming your way soon. And uh, I know we teased it at the top of the show there. Uh, We're going to be covering Starcade 1993, which should be fun. uh, A little bit, 10 years later. And I think we're going to be doing the worst pay-per-view ever, which I know you think is hard to believe, but it's ECW's December to dismember. So, uh, that was the WWE CW December to dismember. I believe that went down in 06. And we've also got star K 2000. So lots of, uh, silly fun shows coming your way. Um, but when also, I look- also on Patreon, we got a couple of bonus podcasts coming up in the remainder of the month of November. So reminder of that too, if you're with us on Patreon, you'll get those. And Tony, when I, uh, take a look at my clock right now, I can't help but feel like it's about that time. And now ladies and gentlemen, it is time for another on camera with Gordon Soley and Bob Cottle. Barbara Clary's going to come in 
Here comes the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, for his fourth interview, and now making her way in is Beth Flair. She's not supposed to be here. Ric Flair's going to come pull her out, and now here comes, oh, my God, here is Ricky Steamboat, and here comes Conrad Thompson, and here comes here comes his wife, here comes the entire Flair, Flair family, and now let's send it down to Tony Schiavone. Tony Schiavone is in the locker room with Harley Race. Harley, what do you think about this show? Fuck it. And we'll see you next time on What Happened When on the MLW Radio Network, as well as on Mondays only on Patron. Promotional considerations paid for by the following. Patreon.com forward slash WHW Monday. If you want more of Conrad Thompson, that fat ass redneck, and Tony Schiavone, complete with behind-the-scenes video and new content every week, then go to patreon.com forward slash WHW Monday and buy loisrews.com. It's one of the hottest sites on prowrestlingtees.com. Get your t-shirts from What Happened When, including the new shirt that says WHW What Happened When on the front and somebody say something about lasagna on the back. Don't forget, loisrules.com is named for a crazy fucking lady. Also buy boxofgimmicks.com with coffee mugs, baby onesies, beach towels, koozies, and a whole lot more. Show your support for what happened when, something to wrestle with, Bruce Preacher, and 83 weeks. And buy what happened when live, coming to the Laughing Skull Lounge on Peachtree in Atlanta, Sunday, December 2nd at 3 p.m. Tickets available at WhatHappenWhenLive.com. Make your plans to join us in Atlanta on December 2nd.